when i'm surprised you have over this from the company when i see the name of the moderators i have passed this phase of election and working on them the anchor is laughing monica is laughing uh, because they have really worked very hard for <laughs> these days have gone be ready next year again <laughs> for all this i know the year I after know. next <laughs> but that, that will be a different body yes yes it will be a different uh, mindset yes yeah uh, abhishek are we live now uh, yes ma'am we are live yeah. sure you oh. can start sharing the screen so that i can welcome everybody please yeah <laughs> a very warm welcome to all the esteemed faculty members to the 18th episode of the public awareness committee with the west zone societies this month we are focusing on menopause as well as antenatal screening because november is an antenatal screening awareness month and october was a menopause awareness month so we have clubbed these two activities together and we are very happy to announce that this is the 18th episode and we are hosting this webinar on the second and the fourth thursdays of every month uh, with respective zones uh, can we have the lamp lighting please abhishek we seek the blessings of lord almighty thank you so much abhishek uh, i would now uh, invite dr priyanka roy to welcome all our faculties and delegates as the chairperson of the public awareness committee he is currently the president of vatok the only asian to be welcome dr priyanka thanks monica good evening everyone as she has already welcomed all of you i again take this opportunity of welcoming all of you to this 18th episode of the webinar and this has only been possible because of the active participation and support of all of you who are the faculties and the delegates who are present here today so first of all i can't start without thanking dr rishikesh pai sir dr madhuri patel ma'am dr alka pande ma'am who are the soul and pillars of this public awareness committee and also dr kalyan barmade of course who is also the national coordinator of this committee i would like to thank uh, our coordinators and welcome them dr monica and dr shatabdi who has put in immense effort and the conveners of the program dr vaidhe marathe ma'am and dr monica gupta ma'am our chief guest dr rishikesh pai sir and none other than dr sunita tandulwarkar ma'am it's such a pleasure to welcome ma'am to this program and i'm i can i can see her very relaxed very relieved because this is i think one of the programs where she does not have to that she does not have the tension of you know like the scientific talks etc and how, how is going to pan etc and things like that because we all know that the way she talks is always brilliant and being a chief guest for this program means a lot to us because we want to take her blessings for this program after getting elected as the president elect of uh, foxy welcome ma'am i would like to also welcome our guest of honors dr parul kotlawala sir and dr asha bakshi ma'am uh, welcome sir welcome ma'am for giving us this time and taking your time out of your busy schedule i would like to welcome uh, dr vrinda joshi and dr vaidhe marathe ma'am once again as the chairperson of the talks and also dr kiran kutkoti sir and dr monica gupta ma'am as the chairpersons we have two brilliant speakers with us dr prashant acharya sir who is going to talk to us on antenatal care recent trends in india and dr anju soni ma'am who is not able to join us for medical emergency the talk is on menopause and hrt we'll see if we can uh, we can pitch in with the talk with someone else over there the panel discussion is on aub in perimenopausal age group and our moderators are dr gorup mandrupkar sir and dr minu agarwal ma'am again brilliant moderators and i'm sure we're going to learn a lot from them in this session the expert is dr suvarna khadilkar ma'am and our panelist uh, expert panelists are dr rashmi khahar ma'am dr sujit kondar dr renu setia dr aditi rathor dr shabna sultan dr monica singh dr sunita wadwani dr darshan uh, wadekar dr bs jodha sir and dr bajrang sir so i welcome all of you to this platform and also welcome team uh, corona remedies as well and uh, i hand over this platform back to maka to kindly take through uh, the 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 inauguration and also the scientific uh, thank you dr priyankur for the welcome note uh, i would like to invite dr sunita ma'am as the chief guest for the program uh, madam is a president elect uh, right now can we have madam slide please satish 
Okay, still he puts up the slide. Yeah. I think yeah. I'll introduce Ma'am. She is, of course, the president elect of Foxy. She has been the president of IAG. She's going to be the president elect of, she's the, she's the president elect of ISAR as well. She has headed most of the organizations and she is a pioneer researcher. She has been the pioneer in, uh, in stem cells, pioneer in laparoscopy. Name any department in OBGYN and she has been a pioneer and she's a leader in that field. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Ma'am. Your smile is quite charismatic and we can see that already. So I welcome you to kindly bless all of us in this program. Thank you. Can we have a close up of this slide? Please close down. Let me have Stop all sharing, my... Abhishek. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Stop Let sharing. me have all my friends with me here. So, first of all, thank you, Public Awareness Committee. Priyankur, very dear to my heart. He knows it. And his programs always are very well thought. And uh, the way he has worked as a committee chairperson, helping to all the presidents of Foxy is commandable. And that's why I think he became a president of some world organization for the youngsters who can, you know, uh, what is the name Priyankur that? It's called Vat Talk. Vat -talk. Vat -talk. World Association of Trainees in Obsgain. Uh, it is for resident doctors. Resident. So, see, till he became a president, I was not aware that there is an organization <laughs> like that. You know, <laughs> that is where when we don't even know the organization, he became a uh, president of that organization. That's what Priyankur is. And Monica, I'm watching you for last more than, I think, two years working yeah. close association, not only with Priyankur in public awareness, right. but even for you come out always with a novel program and I'm very very happy and I hope to see you one day in Foxy as well. Parul, our guest of honor who will be taking over in Hyderabad as a chairperson of ICOG. We congratulate you and we are looking forward for a wonderful ICOG. I think the ICOG, the way Mandakini, the way Lakshmi Srikande, uh, they have taken it to the level. I'm very sure, Aparul, knowing your academics within your genes, I know the ICOG will have a great job and uh, looking forward to work with you. Uh, Minu Agarwal, our own president of Punao BGY Society, along with Gorak, I think is going to moderate the session. And being a very dear friend, I'm always there to wish her all the best for whichever endeavor she wants to go in. We have our vice president, Foxy, Asha Bakshi here. And I think the rest of the people are a little bit busy. But Monica... When I say Monica, it's the convener Monica and the Monica Singh of Bhopal, both. Both of you are my amazing friend. I found huge talent in you. And Monica, whichever post you go in, whether it is a Foxy, whether it is Isar, whether it is a Bhopal OBGY Society, I'm sure you will be doing a justice to that organization. When I see the scientific uh, program, Monica, you have designed it beautifully. Menopause and HRT, a antenatal care, recent trends. Instead of writing all the time, inverting pyramid, when you got Prashant Acharya as a speaker, I'm sure he will come out with all the recent trends and he will talk not only about the first trimester, but he will go beyond the first trimester. I'm very sure about it. So I wish you all the best for this program and thank you for making me a part of you all. Thank you, Monica, and thank you for your reminders all the time. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for blessing us. I would like Priyankur to introduce Parul sir as well. Abhishek. Priyankur. Monica, you can... Monica, you can introduce her, please. Yeah. Uh, we welcome you, sir, as a yeah. chairperson elect of ICOG. He, sir, has been the professor and head at the Sci Institute of Medical Sciences, Ahmedabad. He uh, has been the vice president of ISOPAB the last year, a chairman of the Education Committee of the South Asian Federation of OBGYs, the coordinator for the NASA, as well as the IAS. We welcome you, sir, as a guest of honor, and we request you to please give your blessings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monica. Uh, it is uh, 
indeed a pleasure to be part of this very important activity of public awareness committee and i compliment priyankur and the team for uh, having so many webinars this is number 18 correct so hats off to you people and i see that the program is so well designed you have menopause and pregnancy care and the transition from reproductive to menopause perimenopause and i am sure prashant will go beyond ultrasound in antenatal care and why it would be really interesting to listen to what he says and uh, i think dr soni will not be here otherwise she is an authority on menopause medicine and the panel is very elite and one of the mega panel i have not been part of any panel with 10 panelists i'm sure because of the virtual nature of this webinar it is possible otherwise your stage would be full with 10 people sitting there and two moderators uh, i do not go <laughs> <laughs> sorry to interrupt sir one thing just uh, the aicog i just received the uh, the uh, session for this hyderabad aicog and two moderators and they have put 12 panelists in that so i was a little surprised there is a physical but thing. in their but heart then, yeah, they know most of them might not come most of them might eight, not come that's why four may not come that would be yes, in their exactly, heart <laughs> exactly thank you so much okay yes. so it is very uh, i mean i'm missing the president and secretary of foxy here but president elect makes up for the entire thing and i would not go into taking names of all of you but it is indeed always a pleasure to be interacting with you i did tell dr monica that i have some other commitments and i may not be with you for a longer period of time and i am going to miss some very interesting uh, presentations so i think dr asha will take care of uh, all that thank you very much and wish you a very good webinar thank you thank you sir thank you for joining us and sparing your valuable time uh, i would now take privilege in introduction of dr asha bakshi madam madam is a lead, lead consultant um, at our dr asha bakshi fertility center in association with motherhood hospital indore she is currently the vice president of the west zone foxy and we've had a very great conference at indore ma'am because of you she has been the treasurer of sr a member of the uh, aiccrcog west zone executive committee the founder chairperson of mp iig and mp sr she has been also the past chairperson of the foxy infertility committee the member of the icog governing council we welcome you ma'am and we request you to please say a few words thank you very much dr monica for the kind introduction and i would like to thank uh, dr priyankur roy for the conducting the whole program under the public awareness committee and um, the program has been the whole program has been selected so well and so nice to see dr sunita today um, and uh, under the leader of dr hd pai all the programs are going on very well and this is the beauty of webinars that even just before diwali we are still doing the academic sessions and still not missing out much from the uh, time from the family also so uh, otherwise it's really difficult during the diwali time uh, to take out the time for uh, all these educational activities but uh, foxy has great enthusiasm and so has priyankur and i would like to congratulate priyankur for his latest achievement and uh, so nice to see dr parul kotra wala here as well and uh, dr meenu is there dr prashant acharya is there and uh, monica singh is also there and uh, uh, so uh, it's really nice dr jodha is there dr sunita vadwani so all of you are there and this program is going to be very good and uh, especially the uh, there is lot of effort which has been put in by dr monica umbarpant who is the convener of this program and vedehi and uh, i'm sure the topics you are all waiting to listen to all the uh, topics rather than this uh, discussion so i would just wish you all the best <laughs> and i think you should just get going <laughs> so thank you so much once again for the invitation thank you so much ma'am <laughs> priyankur are you there yes monica Yeah, uh, you want to give any concluding remarks before we conclude no, our inauguration, so that I we can start with the academy. I just want to thank academics. everyone for joining here. 
especially sunita ma'am parul sir and asha bakshi ma'am for the wonderful blessing that you have given us thank you so much we would request you if your time permits to kindly stay on with the with the academic session and put in your inputs if possible if not of yes. course we understand you are busy if not it's absolutely fine and thank you so much once again for joining us thanks a lot thank you priyankul uh, we can now move ahead with an uh, academic session uh, monica ma'am uh, and vrinda ma'am uh, both of you are there so we uh, i will introduce both of you you can then introduce prashant sir abhishek can we have monica madam slide and vrinda joshi madam slide please dr monica gupta madam has been the past president of alwar obijwai society and she is the west zone coordinator for the public awareness committee she is uh, active in most of the public awareness uh, activities of in and around rajasthan she has been the foxy achiever award of the west zone yuva foxy at ranthambore and she is a dheera master trainer and the manyata assessor ma'am we welcome you as a chairperson for this session i would like to introduce dr vrinda joshi madam as the next chairperson for this session please ma can we have madam slide please abhishek Dr. Vrinda Joshi, Madam, is a senior gynecologist uh, from uh, Gajrara Medical College at Gwalior. She has many awards and publications uh, to her credit. She has been the trainer of more, uh, the uh, online training of medical officers on maternal health. She is a straight trainer of the cervical cancer screening and CIN programs. She is also the chairperson of the Mahila Yon Utpidan Shikayat Evam Anmohan Samiti. the member of the medical board for termination of pregnancy the trainer of comprehensive abortion cares as well as a medical teacher for the last 20 years she is also the national ethicon traveling uh, fellowship she has received uh, ma'am we welcome you as a chairperson for this session and uh, we request you to please introduce prashant sir vrinda ma'am yes 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 ma'am please put the uh, slide for yes ma'am uh at the outset i am very much thankful for inviting me for this very informative talk and very uh, a, a galaxy of elegant speakers so about dr prashant he is a medical director and chief consultant of paras advanced center for fetal medicine at ahmedabad he has been a honorary fetal medicine consultant at svp hospital at gujarat university ahmedabad and in icog fellowship award he has been a board member and trustee he has been an ambassador to asia and pacific region icog international faculty of speakers first indian to be honored and icog bids committee he has been an icog advisory board member since 2012 uh, it it's man it will take long time i think uh, we should go to the talk straight away it will take uh, uh, yes i think that's a better suggestion because there are so many uh, uh, feathers in his crown that it makes a big crown no no, no so, it's not like that but i wish right. i wish yes. we, we we will take the use that time yeah right. so, thank you so uh, i i'll share my screen so uh, can you can, can you allow me to share my screen and some yes. please sir please share so i'll i'll share my screen yes can you can you see my screen now yes sir we can see okay. yes sir. perfect thank you very much this is my my cv as such but uh, and i i think let us go to the main talk and it is k2024 i have written 2024 what is going to what we should and what we should think about next year how we should plan the internal care in 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 upcoming year or upcoming time so i, I this is the scenario which happens so it doesn't matter how many resources you have and if you do not know how to use them they will never be enough look at this gentleman he has got so many staircases in front of him but still because he he try to peep in through the wall this is exactly scenario even if when you have got a good basic ultrasound good antenatal care still you don't follow them then this is the scenario 
as an obstetrician yes i i totally agree we have our two fingers works like a stethoscope and a stethoscope to to listen and a good two hands to examine the metal abdomen but 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 if you have a machine capable of doing a reasonable 2d imaging and a doppler you should use it appropriately for antenatal patients without without ultrasound i don't think today's antenatal care is is going to be adequate or enough so how many uh, many times life is like this picture you have the resource but you make the poor decisions so a machine is lying in your consulting room or in your hospital when you don't use it appropriately and this is the scenario where i will never wish that i'll end up in any of the scenario a pregnant lady comes to you i want to ev evaluate the fetus i do a scan a good quality scan to look at a fetus my eventual aim is to have a good healthy mother and 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 an healthy child so in 20 <coughs> this is all possible because because of of the invent and and i think advancement of ultrasound quality machines you have here i think someone to mute themselves please someone's mic is on so if you can mute yourself yes sir muted muted sir yeah so that uh, that is uh, if i i have to consider that way so before 2020 i have i have just written a word antenatal care before 2020 what we do in our antenatal opd we this is a typical pyramid is being followed once in once in first three months then every month then every 15 days and and last month we call her every week that 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 is one of the absolute absolutely i i still i call it as not useless but a kind of uh, unnecessary excessive intensive care where there are many examination where we don't do anything so for example 24 week scan 20 20 28 week antenatal examination 16 week antenatal examination we don't do anything just put our hand on mother mother's abdomen we may measure the weight and the blood pressure job is done actually we don't do any decision making as an as an consultant we should have a visit when we are going to make certain decisions so there are three scans which we usually do it in in, in uh, before 2020 11 to 14 week 18 to 23 week anomaly scan and the last time as we try to look for the growth and doppler this is all <laughs> i'll call it it's a past now because then because why i am saying is the kipras kipros has turned out with an inverted pyramid at one at 12 week one at 20 week then call her at 39 week which is not going to happen in india because this is not not acceptable in india you call a patient right you could just come after four months of your uh four month from uh, fifth month of pregnancy it is not acceptable because we miss so many things so what we have come out is we have published a paper on in in the white journal and and in the conference that it's a tube of pregnancy care now scan at uh, examination and scan at three months where we do a good examination at 13 week we do early anomaly scan we we predict preeclampsia we predict preterm birth. We 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 look for multifetal pregnancy. We look for a chorionicity of the pregnancy, and because both managements are different, we try to follow it that up. So so uh, your preterm birth prediction with aneuploidy risk prediction with NIPT now or without NIPT, uh, depending upon upon your circumstances. The next examination has to be at five months, where at twenty twenty three weeks can we do biometry, anomaly scan, uh, a good detailed basic neurosonogram. A basic fetal uh, echo, eight soft markers. We uh, measure cervical length by transvaginal scan. We predict preeclampsia, and that is how that's how you, my my scanning has to be, and and the evaluation has to be at five months. Then at seven months, we have a very very peculiar thing which happens at seven months because at twenty eight week, uh, late developing anomalies we can pick it up, we can counsel them when to do how 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 to examine, and then there is an entity called early fetal growth restriction. And we as an obstetrician should precisely know what this early fetal growth restriction is and how to deal with, with that. One important point is placenta accreta spectrum. Because the previous section rates are, are, are now, the season section rate is almost 40, 50, 60% now, in, depending upon the center. A previous section with an anterior low lying placenta, where I am worried about spec, uh, placenta accreta spectrum, and that is what I will try and evaluate at seventh month of pregnancy and a nine month. I would be interested in looking for late developing anomalies, but late developing fetal growth restrictions. I would, I would, because here the classic Doppler cascade will not work. And I would also like to do a pleasant decreta spectrum evaluation at that time. For fetal heart, the same thing is applied because at three months of evaluation, a major cardiac defect, which are non compatible with life, I can evaluate, I can rule out. At 20 weeks, I would, I would be able to, 22 weeks, can I would be able to diagnose the small little 
congenital cardiac issues and if still the termination is possible so you can go on that side and if they want to continue you can investigate for for the genetic association at seventh month some of the cardiac defect like cardiac block co-optation of aorta critical aortic stenosis they will they will pop out so they will come out at that time and and at the, at this time you can with the other malformations you can probably refer at appropriate center that okay look you should go to the center for for the delivery so again a time and place will be planning for a peripartum care which will be decided at the ninth month when whenever you are looking during the pregnancy so there are there are baseline baseline six uh, five segment when you are evaluating 11 to 14 weeks scan dating aneuploidy retail anatomy cervical and then uterine so look for five segments if you are as an obstetrician, if you are not doing scan, make sure that whosoever you have referred, they come out with these five separate segments to you. And aneuploidy, as all of you know, that you have to look for the nasal bone, you have to look for the nuclear translucency, and then that is what is the and and ductus venosus. And then you calculate, you calculate the risk and whether how, whether what is what is the scenario, how much is the risk for aneuploidy. If you have as an obstetrician, if you do not know or you don't have a software, I'll give you one very simple rule by which what is new, normal nuclear translucency, I'll tell you. You have measured a CRL, just prefix one. If you have the CRL is 60, then 1.60 is a median normal value of your NT. Okay, if it is 74 of CRL, 1.74 uh, is a median NT. Say for example, instead of one, if this prefix figure is two, you need an IPT. Say, for example, you are evaluating at, at, at the 60 CRL. So 1.6 is a median. 2.6 is at 95th centile, you need NT or NIPT. And if it is a 3.6, you need invasive testing. So just remember these, these rules, you will have you will have a crystal clear decision making and you don't have to rely on anyone else. So what we do is in uh, for uh, any product prediction, the if the risk after doing ultrasound, if the risk is more than one is two hundred, we do CVS. If the risk is less than one is two thousand, we don't do anything. But in if it in intermediate risk, we offer self refitted DNA. Double marker test is dead, and then we we never offer double marker test because because there are a few reasons. There is a limited role of double marker in the era of NIPT. And there is limited role of double marker for uh, in era of PLGF for preeclampsia also. So we don't do double markers. Very, very rarely use a double marker. But we go for self-refilled DNA. That is 2024 antenatal care. And that is what you should be thinking of. Now, and uh, at the early second trimester anomaly, just remember uh, figure 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So what there are five biometries you should be looking at CRL, BPD, HC, AC and female length, that's what a biometry. This is the list of anomaly sections which you should be taking because that's what is going to be 2024 and uh, uh, the assessment of, of the feed fetus. Just simple one section. The two mid sagittal sections, there are a lot many, this is absolutely normal, this is absolutely abnormal. You can have much detail, but the prime section is going to be your nuchal, this anti segment where you can diagnose so many things, nasal bone hypoplasia, the, the forehead which is there depressed or, or or it is protruding out you can diagnose palate you can diagnose the lip you can diagnose the uh, the, the absent corpus callosum you can diagnose open spinal defect increased nuchal translucency you can have lot many things which you can diagnose a palate is easier to diagnose and you should be looking for these three dots sign in for the palate evaluation in in your upcoming scan uh, the heart of, of course three vessel view three vessel view Four chamber of the heart, abdominal circumference, that is one of the basic things which is going to be the future of, of the first time it's a scan because you can diagnose so many things just by, by doing a 15 second. A basic CVS, as I told you, you can have rest right from side abdominal circumference. I have, I'm showing you the various, various mode, slow flow, HD flow, color flow. You can you can look for the uh, fetal heart in the first trimester. That is going to be a routine antenatal care. And this is this is an arch of the aorta. Arches you can look for the arch of aorta, all three branches. That beautiful images you can have. Now the aim of first time is a scan is is there are a couple of things. Always detectable means you should be able to detect even in court of law. If you have missed any ecrania or lower you are you will face trouble if you have done the scan. 
undetectable, you can't detect. So I'm not worried about these two segments. But but in the recent era, those potentially detectable, I've just listed, I'm just listing the malformations, which are potentially detectable. You should think about how can you make it, how can you make this is detectable? And these potentially, these are the things, things which if you convert from potentially detectable to detectable, that is what is what is going to be required in in upcoming time and that is what is going to be a recent end in drip care as far as as far as the first trimester is concerned so what should i expect from from my first trimester examination ultrasound in first trimester used for dating viability diagnosis multifetal pregnancy aneuploidy assessment by nt nb dv and tr plays a small part in aneuploidy assessment in the era of nipt i can i can predict that nt scan is going to be dead in upcoming two or three years it is not going to be early NT scan. It is going to be early anomaly scan. So my primary aim is going to be not NT. It is an early anomaly which are not compatible with life. I would try to evaluate those. So that is my my uh, my prediction. That's what is going to happen. Detection rate of aneuploidy after new algorithm uh, will be more than 99% if you use your NIPT. All little malformations which are not compatible with life can be evaluated. Where a routine anomalies can be 55%. Early cardiac assessment should be done. Early CNS assessment is going to be possible. Preterm birth prediction because the cervical length is essential. Look for the uterine artery dopplers. You can, you can start aspirin if it is more than the PI is more than 2.5. In the mean, mean uterine PI is more than 2.5. What we call as an improper placentation during the first trimester because still you have got a second phase of placentation is pending where you can help by giving these aspirin. So, and, and of course, in multifit pregnancy, diagnose a monochronic versus dichronic, and that is what is going to be new after two, two, 2021, and that is what I would put it across in, in, in upcoming uh, 2024 uh, antenatal care. Next scan, it comes at a five-month, where there is, there is a, a, a full list which is going to be available, but in nutshell, I would put it this way, that these there are eight segments. One biometry, anomaly, echocardiography, aneuploidy, cervical length, uterine artery, look at a placenta and look at a liker. So these are the total eight segments everyone has to evaluate. And these eight segments, if I want to take care, I would put it across just like all the sections, just like this. And and, and I would like to I would like to put it across that okay, I will be looking at a biometry with these seven points, CNS for these three sections, cardiac for these four sections. Eat for my aneuploidy uh, screening, a cervical length by transvaginal scan only, a preterm birth and an FGR prediction by doing uterine artery Doppler, also preeclampsia and FGR by a uterine artery Doppler, placenta and liker. The basic biometry I would like to put it across, but but you should have you should have a very precise very precise sections and precise measurement, and and that is how I would like to put it across. And I would like to uh, tell you one thing that if you know the basic ultrasound section, basic ultrasound plans, then your evaluation is going to be easier. This is a basic scan about, about the fetal biometry. The, the basic second time is a scan for the fetal brain. A posterior fossa, when you try to evaluate the cerebellum, but now this is everyone is doing. But I would like to add that in 2024, it has to be, uh, it is going to be a mid societal section of the brain where I, 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 I look for these corpus callosum and I look for the vermis. Okay, so this is a 2024 ev addition, addition, to, addition to my, my uh, the, uh, examination. I would like to tell you one thing, that a role of volume imaging in fetal brain evaluation is, is, is phenomenal. You can evaluate the brain just, just beautifully, but it's not beautiful. It's about my diagnosis is going to be much better and that this is what I will expect. So use of 3D volume imaging with a high contrast or what we call the VCI is going to be the key for upcoming 2024 evaluation. A spine evaluation, why I'm showing you your spine? Because the spine, that is going to be one of the important point because all spinal defect, this is a 3D volumes, uh, you can evaluate the spine beautifully. Now, why I'm showing you is that there is one good reason. This this was this was a, a meningo seal which was which was diagnosed. But what we could see that okay the cord which which is which is here and the, there is a CSF which is lying posterior posterior to the cord near the skin and this means the cord is not tethered so outcome may be good 
and this is exactly what happened the patient continued the pregnancy and baby baby was operated and and this is the scar and now baby is almost uh, almost around 3 and 1/2 to 4 years it can walk everything is normal so all spinal defect may not need a termination it needs a good profile evaluation and then then examination the face profile of course and uh, uh, not it is not for the face for me it, it is for the nasal bone it is for me it's it it, it is a periculosal artery for me it is a corpus callosum and for me it is it is it is this vermis evaluation that is what i can see in that uh, fetal face so i will not go in the step wise evaluation but i'll give you a very overview what you should be asking or you should be doing in your 2024 week uh, any uh, screening of of your antenatal care a basic four chamber view abdocitis evaluation from abdominal circumference four chamber three vessel and three vessel trachea view i want just gentle sweep from 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 abdomen to the upper part of the thorax where you can see everything and that is what i will put it across that even if you have got even if you have got these three basic section like a four chamber view plane then then even if you have got a but three vessel three vessel trachea view or a crossing of the section intraventricular anatomy crossing three vessel and a three vessel trachea view your diagnosis is correct more than 80% you will be able to identify fetal cardiac defect so that this is what i have i have just put it across in front of you that these are the malformations will be diagnosed by you by if you are doing just just three basic sections a uh, new volumes new volume imaging can give you some phenomenal images i i, I totally agree but if you use it then you can you can have some beautiful unbelievable images which you can always have if you have got a volume images just like that uh moving for the next uh, the, the section is enucleoidy evaluation you should be looking for these uh, enucleoidy look for the soft markers because this soft marker evaluation definitely will give you a lot of age in 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 your evaluation and you will be able to calculate your risk for trisomy 21 in your report who in head is borderline ventricular megaly nuchal fold thickness who in the heart aberrant right subclavian artery ecogenic cardiac focus who in abdomen is pyelectris is an ecogenic bowel and two bones is a nasal bone and a short femur so eight malformations eight soft marker you should be looking at and look at her, these negative and positive likelihood ratio you will be able to calculate this like this now coming to last section of this uh, second trimester is cervical length look for the length of the cervix that is right but also i i am just adding one point is look the length after the fundal pressure test because these kind you may occasionally have these incompetent nodes and it may open which was previously 27 where you might not do anything but after fundal pressure it it remains 14 so i always put it across that always do evaluation and intervene like what whether you are comfortable with osteotomy you can go if you are comfortable with progesterone you can give but make sure that you intervene at least when when the cervical length is 25 mm of length because that is a 10 centile and it gives you a genuine reason to identify now prior history for preterm birth is important watch for the length of at the first trimester if missed look at the length in the second trimester look at a progressive shortening 4 mm shortening then your last examination in a month it's it it is heading towards your preterm birth look for the funneling look for the fundal pressure leading to shortening or funneling then you can have progesterone or circular as per your choice but you should have a low threshold for intervention in multifetal pregnancy a uterine artery doppler in second trimester there are this is all because of the physiological changes because of what we call as a presentation uh, the 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 uterine the the the, uh, the uterine artery and the branches the myometrium will get uh, get absorbed resorbed and the art artery become like a venous lacuns and you will have a low resistance flow instead of high resistance flow that is what is known as proper presentation and these proper presentation you know that when you have got a, prep, a proper presentation the uterines are will have a good diastolic flow and these good diastolic flow will tell you that okay it has got a, a resistance after the point of introgression is low and you have got a good presentation uh we have made it a thumb rule like this that in first trimester any mean pi is right and left take a mean if it is more than 2.5 in first trimester or 1.75 in second trimester it is what you call it is an improper presentation and this improper presentation takes you to 
a complication called PIPIP, that is like preeclampsia, IUD, prematurity, and IUGR, and placental abruption. It has got more than 97% negative predictive value. So if the uterines are normal, this lady is not going to develop these complications. So that is what I would put it across. You can add on PLGF or you can add on PEP-A uh, for, for, your, for your better evaluation. Or you can, if you find it is as an improper presentation, it is a rule you have, you can start aspirin, but there is a role of low mercury aspirin when and as and when required. That is what is a, a, a thing you should be, you should be looking for. Now coming to the next segment is seven month scan. I am interested in the rest of the things we have evaluated, but when you find your lower segment ballooning like this, when Neeta Bush layer, there is no differentiation between the myometrium and, and the placenta or vertical vessels. When you have got a vertical vessels going towards the bladder, think about placenta accreta. The easiest thing to look for is the bulging of lower uterine segment. That is important. Look at these vessels going, which is crossing 90 degree. Look and think about placenta accreta spectrum. And that is where you should be. You should be worried. Coming to ninth month, I think I've got still seven minutes. I'll finish up by this thing, by, by that time. Fundal height, I know which very few of us, we use the fundal height by taking a measurement, but there is a role of fundal height if it is falling four centimeters short that, that you can think about fetal growth restriction. But now fetal growth restriction is diagnosed by two, two systems, only AC and abdominal circumference or with an addition of a Doppler if abnormal Doppler is there, then you call it as a growth restriction. But in India, we take it like it is only AC or expected fetal weight, which is smaller than 10 centile. We call it as a growth restriction. But nowadays, now the entire system is changed. See, look at look at this year. This is 2021. This preeclampsia definition is, is absolutely different. Now, we used to call more than 140-90. It's a preeclampsia pregnancy induced hypertension. If it is associated with proteinuria, we call it as a preeclampsia. This is a traditional definition, but the 2021 is AGOG, American Journal of OBGYN. They, they, they have, along with an association with the International Society of Study of Hypertension in Pregnancy, what is, they, is known as ISSHP, they come out with three more additional factors. One is association with a maternal factor. So maternal factor plus fetal factor, maternal factor, fetal factor plus angiogenetic factor. These angiogenetic factor are nothing but the PLGF and, and, and some placental anomalies. So let, let, let me put it this way. So I'm just showing you the complete graph here. So the recent guideline, you have got a proteinuria, you may have headache, you may have visual symptom, you may have right from eclampsia, blindness. These are also of all pleasant platelet count, abnormal platelets abnormal creatine levels or abnormal uh, the, the hepatic enzymes or or when you have got a fetal growth, growth restriction set in or IUD or uteroplacental insufficiency or all comes under the category of preeclampsia. So now the preeclampsia definition is different than what we had until yesterday I think. So because there are many reasons for this fetal growth restriction I won't go into detail but make sure that you use your Indian biometry because Indian biometry, it will give you quite a lot of additional information. But when you use your it, it, biometry, make sure that it falls above 10 centile because there are very few biometries which we, you will get a 10 centile. This is our biometry, which we have come out, uh, Indian biometry by us only, uh, Prashant. We, 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 have, we have published this biometry, which is accepted globally. It, if it is falling below third centile, they all are growth restricted. And same thing is, is, is with your expected fetal weight. If it is above, above 10 centile, that is normal, but it falls below third, three centile. They are below third centile. They are all growth restricted babies. And that is what I would put it across. But here there is, there is, there is, a, 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 I would put it as, 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 as there is, there is a clutch there. There is a, you have to draw a line at 32 week. Any growth restriction happening before 32 week or any growth restriction happening after 32 weeks, they are all defined as early growth restriction and late fetal growth restriction. That is true for abdominal circumference and that is true for even expected fetal weight. If the expected fetal weight falls below third centile, that is growth restriction 
early growth restriction and after 32 week it is called late fetal growth restriction now because fetal growth restriction at the, i'm just giving you the the, the definitions and and uh, this you, you can you can read from the reference this is ishwa guideline but i would like to tell you one thing the primary difference is is because of of the mechanism the, or the problem which are which are really very different so what happens during during your your uh, the, the transport when the mother's blood come into the space and it goes into maternal vein so spo2 which was 100 it has it has gone down to 45 but umbilical vein which drains from from the fetus I mean, umbilical artery drains from the fetus, takes the blood to the placenta for the membrane exchange. And when it comes, it has got a P2 to 21. But when it goes out to umbilical vein, it is 35. So it carries the oxygen. But when in case of growth restriction, the placental villi are less. And that's the reason the less number of exchange which happens. So you have got less villi. That means architecture is at fault. Umbilical artery will have increased resistance because you have got a less number of vascular architecture. Uterine artery will have increased resistance because of the same reason. And, and eventually, baby will develop hypoxia and baby will react to this hypoxia by, by brain sparring effect. In late fetal growth restriction, the problem is not the placental villi. The problem is in the, in, in, in the membrane. The, the membrane is, is not working. It's not allowing the oxygen or glucose to transport. And that's the reason you you have got you will have a, a normal resistance of uterine normal resistance of normal pi umbilical artery will have low resistance normal pi but still baby will have a lack of oxygen which is going to happen and this it will lead to redistribution setting once you have got a redistribution setting you may you should you can evaluate by either by doing a doppler or computerized cardio cardiotopography NST has got no role whatsoever. So forget about non-stress test. It is a computerized CTG or the Doppler. So it is when to do what. So eventually, because it is all about it is all about the redistribution of of the entire system and the the left outflow if throws blood out, ten will go to the heart, sixty will go to the brain, but remaining thirty will go to the descending water. If the right outflow tract throws hundred blood ml blood 10 will go to the lungs but 19 will go to the ductus so total in descending aorta 120 ml will go but from that only 25 will go to the lower limb and rest of the 95 will go to practically to the placenta for exchange i'm giving you an example that means half of the complete cardiac output will go to the placenta for exchange so whenever there is some some problem this entire system will lead to redistribution and you may you will find a uh, find it like uh, increased resistance from forward flow to reverse of umbilical artery and in 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 middle cerebral artery what you will find is is probably practically you will have instead of instead of this you will have a high resistance flow and instead of high resistance flow you will have a low resistance flow that is you will find you can calculate the cpr but i'm yes i know you can calculate the cpr but for me for me it is it is the one of the important point is going to be the aortic stomach which gives you quite a lot of information and these aortic stomas gives you uh, a, a much detailed information about the fetal dilatation. Ductus venosus is the vessel to evaluate. If ductus venosus is bad, that means you are talking about the severe fetal hypoxia and that is where that, that is where I it is going to be it is going to be the practically the dead fetus which which is because it will end up in a CCF. So this is a classical cascade which is going to be followed up and and uh, there was a stage based classification which was uh, suggested by greater cause but after 2017 everything has changed and uh, it's not to be utilized uh, for sure because the iswag has come out iswag has come out with the new guidelines and these new guidelines i i can i can show you this is a complicated graph let me make it simple for you for delivering in india because classical casket it will be followed in early fetal growth restriction. Wait till there is no forward flow in diastole in umbilical artery, or wait till you have got ductus venosus is 0.95. So simple thing is one absent in diastolic flow in umbilical artery or ductus venosus if it reaches to 0.8 that is at 95th centile. Wait till this time if at all you have reached to any of the scenario deliver the child. 
and in case of late fetal growth restriction it is the classical casket which is not being followed so the management is different and here it is as i told you it is the membrane which is at fault and because membrane is at fault the, the umbilical artery will have a normal resistance and that is exactly the reasons because the the brain will sense the high eo2 and that's the reason the first change you will expect is in middle cerebral artery then it is in cpr ratio then is the umbilical artery and then is the ductus venosus so this is the decision making as far as your late growth restriction is concerned now let me put it across just in in nutshell if ctga if you have you have the computerized ctg with you then you should be you should be thinking up you should be thinking about in 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 a in, in a system where you can you can just wait in case of 32 week or less you, your trigger for delivery has to be this five. If it is more than 32 weeks, you should have a trigger for delivery of these seven points. If you don't have a computerized CTG with you, don't worry. Your number of triggers will be reduced. You have got the triggers which if your computerized CTG is not available and the grow, if it is 32 week less than gestation, then trigger for delivery are two. Ductus venosus more than 95th percentile or absent or reverse in umbilical artery. More than 32 weeks of gestation, the trigger for delivery is these four. MCA less than 5th centile, CPL less than 5th centile, ductus more than 95th centile or absent or reverse umbilical artery. Never exceed 39 weeks of the gestation. And as I told you, the, the once you have diagnosed fetal restriction, your journey starts, your, your, your road is a good antenatal surveillance by Doppler and a growth velocity. And this is how you should be looking at. You should be looking for the for the Dopplers and and the and the and the uh, your decision making for uh, this growth restriction is again as I told you that these are the factors. And my ultimate destination is long neurological outcome outcome at the adult life. Now, what is what is the adult care in in after twenty one? This is what we have already discussed. But what the additional advantage? For the mother's antenatal profile, this is a standard. You can add on, delete something depending upon your requirement. But TSH with free free T4, that is with T free T4. Don't do without that. For previously affected fetus, appropriate index case evaluation. Please get it done. Some genetic tests, if required for the previous child, make sure that you evaluate them appropriately. But for the fetus, it is if you do it what I said. That you can you can improve the aneuploidy detection, early anomaly detection. You can improve. You can improve early severe preeclampsia prediction, preterm birth prediction. You, this is what as an obstetrician you want. So all in all, there are a lot many things for mother and fetus in upcoming in two, two zero two four. You you should be expecting and you should be doing. Thank you. Thank you very very much for for uh, patient hearing. And thank you, the team of Foxy and Priyankur for inviting me here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prashant. It has been, it is rather a very technologically uh, sound antenatal care. And uh, I hope that all our next uh, obstetricians will be following everything, understanding things and making antenatal care as simple, but as uh, vivid, illustrative and predictable for everybody. But at this note, I would also like to uh, share something like we, I am in Madhya Pradesh and uh, even simple antenatal care, like as you said, a doctor putting their hands on, on the abdomen of the woman is not obtained by a lot, large number of women and that's a I huge I, mammoth I, I, task. I hate it. Sorry, I totally disagree with you because even 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 any of the any of all hospitals or i would put all phcs all chcs you have these many facilities are available uh, so in that days in india they are all gone that antenatal care is not available i sorry but i i, I totally disagree with with those points i think uh, uh, because uh, i i really i really mean it that it is it's not it is application of ourselves to the situation we can always refer to an appropriate center. There are free centers, free government medical colleges. They can always get a scan done, at least one or two, whenever possible. Uh, get your blood test done. That is also can be easily done. There are things which are possible. You have to decide, okay, I have to do this. 
then it will be all done. Uh, without that, it won't be possible. I can I can guarantee you that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for this. I think somewhere even I uh, partly agree with Dr. Uh, Vrunda and also with you, Dr. Prashant, that uh, there has to be a will, of course, that is the thing. But the thing is the people who have the will, they move to bigger cities and the smaller cities sometimes uh, are to, do lack some facilities like a city. We want, we are thinking about future. So we don't want to be... In future, yes, so, I agree with you. Yeah, that is the all those excuses aside, we try to find out what's the solution, what can we, how can we help them? Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. So initially, we can do, we can have a, uh, in the from the PHC, high risk patients can be transferred and yes. later on the awareness will increase and uh, initially the sonography was also not evident. Now people are going for, a, for four or five sonography during the pregnancy. Initial days, hardly one sonography used to be done and later on as awareness increase i think the investigations and predictability of the complication will also increase even that in the is, small centers also that is why this is the public awareness committee that is what you are doing an excellent mm -hmm. job in that yes correct thank you sorry thank you runda ma'am and uh, thank you monica ma'am uh, for judging nino ma'am for your comments Prashant sir, it was an exhaustive talk and I am sure all the delegates have uh, had a very good take-home message after that. Uh, I would like to, uh, Dr. Monica, madam, to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Shobna Mohanty, ma'am. At uh, the first instance from uh, the Public Awareness Committee, ma'am, we want to thank you immensely for accepting our invitation at the last moment and joining us for this webinar right now to give a talk about HRT. I request uh, Monica, ma'am, to please introduce Madam now. It's my immense pleasure to introduce Shobna Mohanty, ma'am. She is a consultant gynecologist and laparoscopic surgeon at Sun Medical Center, Tishur. She was a past president IMS, past president IMA Tishur, past general secretary, Quiz chair, and West uh, website chair. And she has organized various endoscopic workshops. And she is a South Zone coordinator of Foxy Histoscopic Workshop in 2011. Ma'am, please, we are waiting for your talk. Over to you. Um, ma'am, I will just speak because I think Madam is not unmuted. In the meantime, uh, Minu Ma'am, can you... Um, discuss with Prashant sir with uh, the take-home messages from his lecture. I will just call up ma'am immediately. Surely, surely. Yes, yes. Dr. Prashant, are you around? Uh, Dr. Prashant, are you around? Okay. Ma'am, uh, I think you can give a take-home message if she is not there. Um, Prashant sir has left. Okay, 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 okay. Sh shall we start with the panel first and then you can have the next talk? Is that okay? By the time they are setting it up? Dr. Gorak is also here. I just spoke to him. Just give me one one minute, ma'am. Just okay. give me one minute. Yes, ma'am. Surely. surely. And the take-home message for the antenatal care is ki we have to diagnose whatever possible in the antenatal period because the obstetric as it was an unpredictable branch and with increasing diagnostic techniques i think it is becoming more and more predictable we can diagnose many things before if we are little bit aware of it so yes. the awareness among the obstetrician is also important before we are going to aware the patients like the pleasant accreta when we are land up into it it is a really havoc and before if we diagnose it early it will be very helpful for us a simple sonography is going to help you out a lot. If we are not going for the MRI and all these things, I think we should learn how to do a proper sonography. One very important thing is that as obstetricians, we cannot tell the patient that everything is good with you. Hmm. 
that is very very important not only from a medical legal point of view but also for your own satisfaction or for patient satisfaction patient comes to you thinking that i'm going to the gynecologist or the obstetrician and that person is going to tell me if my baby is fine mm -hmm. we have to tell them that this is a teamwork i can only see that the baby is fine the heartbeat is okay but whether the baby is anatomically normal has to be seen by a fetal medicine specialist so that information should go to the patient and we should not uh, the obstetrician should not take all the load onto themselves uh, saying that the baby is absolutely fine. So, uh, because there can be anything, even in the first trimester, you can pick up. Sometimes you can't pick up in the first trimester, second trimester. The other day I had a patient, the third trimester it was picked up and very, very difficult to explain to the patient. So, if you have a team, a complete team talking to the patient, it is always better. Uh, so, don't take the complete um, award. Uh, the accolades and also the you know if there is a brick batting then also you have you are sharing with someone so i but we gynecologists should also have a very good knowledge about the sonography okay, how to I read madam has joined yes right. welcome madam shobna mohente ma'am please share your slides And I was the chairperson for imaging science for um, from 18 till, till last year mm -hmm. and uh, I learned so much. There is so much in fetal medicine. Uh, now it is, I think, a special branch by itself. So obstetrician should know basic ultrasound, how At to least. read the ultrasound, how to understand the Dopplers when to intervene, when not to intervene. But uh, because every city, like Dr. Vrinda said, fetal medicine specialists are not available. That is a little bit of a challenge. So uh, keeping that in mind, I think the obstetrician should understand, should try to uh, learn at least the basics of uh, uh, fetal medicine. And yeah. madam, they should have at least knowledge to interpret the report also. Right. Yes, the report is also there, but the obstetrician is not able to interpret that and that is become a little bit difficult. Right. Uh, thank you, Monica, ma'am and Meena, Aminu, ma'am. Uh, we have Dr. Shobna, madam, here. Shobna Madam, thank you immensely for joining us at the last moment and accepting our invitation for this talk. Uh, I would request uh, Monica Madam to reintroduce Madam in a, only a few words because Madam... No, no, just it's okay. Back. It doesn't matter. Yes, anyway, I'm standing. So <laughs> nobody has come listening to my uh, CV. They just want to hear the topic. So I will sure, start definitely. my topic. Madam, Madam, you can please. One minute. I have not uh, done slide share. I'll do that first. Yes. Abhishek, please allow Madam to search. Share her slides. Yes, ma'am. I have to put on the slide share on the PPT now. That I have not. Yes, ma'am. I'll do that. Thank you so much, ma'am, for chipping in in the last moment. We are very, very grateful, ma'am. No, no problem at all. Priyankur has called me, so I said, okay, fine, I'm free. <laughs> so I'll do it. No problem. Yes, ma'am. Just make it full. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Uh, how many minutes? You please tell me when I should stop. I don't remember how many minutes this PPT was. Ma'am, the talk is usually for 20 minutes, ma'am. But Okay. So I'll try to rush through it. I don't I don't remember that it is 20 minutes PPT or 25 minutes. I don't remember. No, it's long back. Mm -hmm. So anyway, mm -hmm. so MHT is uh, generally is uh, given for the hot flashes. The main indication for MHT is hot flashes. We all know it is a feeling of warmth. It happens in around 50% of women. Uh, that's the newest study that I'm conducting now all India. Although they say 85%, we have had pan-India results. Even 50% is too high because South India, we are all getting just 25% in our data. But somehow the all India data is showing 50%. So may, every 2% will have it at least in North India. That's all the study is coming. It's being written down the new study. The uh, hot flashes basically come because of uh, fluctuations in um, 
estrogen levels and once it re reaches a nadir post menopause somewhere around 60 plus and all that then you don't get hot flashes it's when you get into menopause either before or after that you get your hot flashes that's because the fluctuating estrogen levels uh, confuses the hypothalamus and so you know it doesn't know how to put on the thermostat so the the person starts feeling hot even before the thermostat should be on so it's a little confused. And so you have, when a person comes with hot flashes, you can't give, you know, drugs. Uh, you can't just say take uh, some diet and all that. When they're really bad, you have to give drugs. And the mainstay is either estrogen alone in a woman who's estrogenized or estrogen progesterone or tibalone, which is a selective tissue estrogenic activity regulator or basidoxyphin, which is tissue selective estrogen. Uh, yes. So now, um, uh, the doses microgen and micronized estradiol or conjugated estrogen micronized estradiol is one or two milligram estradiol valerate is one or two milligram conjugated estrogen is 0.2625 the best progesterones are the micronized progesterone but they are costly the age old ones are MPA 5 milligram uh, for cyclic which is the last 12 days of the month you have to write it down for the patient so the cyclic is 1 to 25 days, you give your estrogen. and the last 10 to 14 days, you give your progesterone. Rest of it, I won't read out because it's a short presentation. So, you know, what is, uh, this is just uh, conjugated estrogen is from the horses, a serum. 17 beta estradiol metabolizes to estrone, estriol and estrogen sulfate. Estradiol valerate is a very old one. Now, this ethinyl estradiol, this is what is there in OC pills. It is a very hatta hatta estrogen because it has got uh, alpha ethinyl group. It prevents the oxidation of the 17 beta hydroxyl group. So, it will not get hydroxylated fast and it will remain there for a long time. So, it's going to be, you know, it's got four times more potency than your conjugated estrogen or estradiol or valerate or whatever you have. That's where you will get. A DVT with your OC pills, but you won't get a DVT with your uh, conjugated estrogen or valerate or whatever. Estriol in our student days, it was there, but nobody ever gives it for MHT anywhere. So, to reiterate, one tablet of conjugated estrogen, you have to take four tablets to equal that of one COC. Therefore, in women who smoke, obese, have migraines and hypertension, you are allowed to give your uh, normal MHT, but you are not allowed to give your COC. So, you have to remember that. Now, transdermal MHT for all the patients with cholesterol and things like that, because it does not modify the markers of coagulation. It passes the liver and everything. It is more consistent. You don't know, it doesn't have to go through 16 foot of uh, gut. So it can directly enter the blood circulation. So we do have uh, sprays and uh, creams. The creams have to be applied on the hand and uh, it has to be left for five minutes. But uh, the spray will get absorbed very fast. But of course, uh, the spray is a little more uh, costly. Uh, the Lenzato people have got the spray and the Intas people have got the uh, ointment. The infertility people are also using these uh, things. So it's all available in the market. If you want to give your uh, Ambani's or whoever has got enough money and who don't want to get into trouble when they have got cholesterol and things like that, you can afford to take your sprays or ointments. You know, it will uh, one tube will last 60, 26 days. So classical symptom of hot flash is not a inherent health hazard. No? So people are not willing to spend so much for it. That is the main problem. If you say you've got cancer, they will spend for it. If you've got something else uh, that will make them die, they will spend for it. But for hot flashes, oh, why should I spend such a big thing? That's the general indication. But the real indications for transdermal are triglyceridemia where you can, if you can afford to spend migraine, diabetes, controlled hypertension, existing gallbladder disease, obesity, smoking, varicose veins, etc. Progesterones are generally an integral part of menopausal hormone therapy if the uterus is intact. Even that's becoming rare these days, of course. But if the uterus is there, the endometrium should not get a hypoplasia. And so you have to give your progesterone. The doses are MPA5, 
uh, Didrogestron 10, micronized 300. That's pretty high, no? Uh, so these are the doses. Basically, it's the progesterone which stimulates the lobular system, not the estrogen, which only stimulates the duct system. And most of the cancer is in the lobular system. Therefore, progesterone causes breast cancer and therefore not the estrogen. And so the breast-friendly progesterone should be given. And uh, they are the better. That's why you have to spend more on your diprogesterone or micronized progesterone uh, because they are most uh, breast-friendly. But all said and done, and you also get a better sleep with natural progesterone. You have your antenatal patients, you give them a little bit, a bit of micronized progesterone. They say, doctor, I'm feeling so tired. It is a fact, and we may or may not diagnose it because we say first trimester, they are not, they are anyway tired. No, it's actually progesterone does make you feel tired, you know. Yes, the WHO trial is a death knell of all, the, all MHT earlier. That's because most of uh, the the patients, they started getting stroke, breast cancer, infarction, increased risk. That was because the study was done on 60 plus women. And in the 60 plus women, what is the difference? At age 50 to 59, the blood lipids are improved. But once the plaques are already formed, the prothrombotic effect of estrogen will add to the already formed plaques. And then you will have those uh, plaques going into your brain or heart and causing heart attack or stroke. That's why it's a problem. The younger people don't have those plaques already formed. So by itself, estrogen is good in the younger women, but in the older women, you can't do that. So if a 60-year-old woman comes to you and the, uh, one day and say, I've heard of MHT, I went to, through the net, please give it to me. No, you can't give that that late. She should have come earlier to you. But even if for osteoporosis, if you want to start MHT, not after 60, not after 10 years. With eight, you have to stop at 55 years or more than 10 years after menopause. Suppose you have your menopause at 50 years, then maybe you can give it to a 60-year-old woman. That's how it is. But after all, this fear of cancer is actually overplayed. And only after giving EPT for four years, you can get CA breast, you know. EPT does not appear to initiate malignant transformation, only to potentiate it. In fact, if you have a cancer, it will show it out faster. Otherwise, you wouldn't have known it is, there is a cancer. And how many women actually take EPT for more than four years? Once their hot flashes are gone in the first three years, they don't take it. So all this cancer, cancer, cancer with progesterone or whatever is actually overplayed. So the point is that the evidence says that after five years use of estrogen progesterone, you will get eight extra cases per 10,000 women. So won't it, wouldn't you be in the 9,222? Uh, My maths is bad, but uh, you are just eight in 10,000 extra. Is it such a big risk? I don't know. The risk of getting uh, associated with long-term estrogen use is really much lower than the risk conferred by obesity, inactivity, and alcohol use. You are willing to do all that, but you're not willing to take your MHT saying you'll get cancer. But what are the side effects of cancer? Uh, this MHT? As a practitioner, you should know that it can cause GI symptoms, painful tingling and swelling of the breasts, endometrial bleeding. That's say you don't use your pad for a long time and suddenly you start reusing it. They're not very happy with you. Headaches may increase. They stop with menopause, but it may increase. And... After 78 year, weeks after MHT, you can even get inflamed pancreas and you will think it is appendicitis. You will forget you have given MHT. Liver function checks can be affected. So these things should be there at the back of your mind when you prescribe it. And dry eyes, anybody has got dry eyes, cannot be always MHT. Increased deep pain thrombosis. I already told you, you can't take COC and all that. But there is increased deep pain thrombosis even only with MHT, you know, not just UC. So such things can happen. So how do you know which is at fault? If there is breast tenderness, reduce the estrogen. If it's irritability, depression, reduce the progesterone. Because uh, water retention and headaches, you have to reduce the progesterone or change the progesterone. So this is, again, you can restrict salt intake, cut down on caffeine and chocolate. Who takes chocolate anyway otherwise? Uh, so, fluid retention and bloating, you can't wear your blouses anymore, your dresses are becoming tight. Switch to a low-dose transdermal estrogen. 
and switch to a low dose progesterone, switch to a micronized progesterone. More changes, you can actually change over to Tibolone. Okay. And progestin also, you can change over to an LNG IUS. So you don't have to go on taking every 14 days. No? Put in your LNG IUS, give estrogen, that's it. So you'll have less of the side effects. Uh, so you can take estrogen at night, lower the dose if there is GI symptoms. Now we come to genitourinary syndromes where recurrent UTI, recurrent dryness and recurrent pain. There you can use vaginal creams. Uh, either in conjugated estrogen, it's applied for daily or or even estradiol, uh, which is not really available here. Estriol is the one which is commonly used, but nowadays it's not there in the market, at least in Kerala. The dose is 0 0.5 to 1 gram daily for the first two weeks and then weekly, uh, twice weekly and then weekly. And the safety data is there for two years. You don't have to substitute progesterone. Because the dose of estrogen given in the vaginal one is so low that you really don't need progesterone added at all. And so that is the dose again repeated. Now conjugated estrogen again uh, vaginally depending on the severity. Estriol cream, one applicator flu full of cream. Now let's go on to Tibolong. People say I feel tired, I don't have sex drive and my husband has got a sex drive. So, shall I take estrogen? No, estrogen won't give you the sex drive. You have to give Tibolone. It's You know, actually, in 1942, all this estrogen was marketed. And then it caused bleeding. Then they started progesterone. Then the progesterone started getting cancer. So, they needed a drug which you know, will give you, reduce the hot flashes, won't stimulate the endometrium. And then after 25 years, they found this uh, Tibolone and Coming to the market, it was 2004. So what is Tibolone? It is a uh, it gets converted to estrogen, androgen, and progesterone. So you have three in one, you know. So you don't have to take progesterone, supplementation. Everything is there in that one particular tablet. And it will reduce flushing. It will reduce bone resorption. Everything that estrogen does, it will do. Plus androgen effect, effects like improving sleep. Prevents the loss of muscle strength, improves lean body mass, decreases proliferation of breast epithelium. In fact, if you want to do a mammogram on a woman with estrogen, the mammogram will change because the estrogen changes the breast architecture. But when you're giving a patient tibble on, the breast architecture won't change and then you can get a good mammogram. You know? That's the difference between the tibble on and that. And the sex drive can also improve because of the androgen. So, and, uh, but the... Uh, Lipid profile is almost the same, lowers the levels of HDL and uh, lipoprotein levels and all that. But status of cardiovascular protection is really not known. Dose is 2.5 milligram per day. It's better to start one year after menopause because if you won't have abnormal bleeding, then they won't blame you for the drug. That's a smart way, you know. So, but if it is... Uh, there, you have to reassure them that it's uh, as long as it's not excessive and as long as endometrium is not more than five, really, you don't have to worry. It just doesn't matter. At least you're getting rid of your hot flashes. So you have to caution them, uh, teach them. About starting it after 60 years because estrogen can't be started, it's not the same. The indications, contraindications, it's all the same for estrogen and tibolon. You can't start after 60 years, whether it is tibolone or whether it is estrogen. Yes, it may decrease for body fat. So, dieting, you know, some sort of, it's easier, no? Increase the fat, freeze mass and total body water. Weight gain should not be a major concern. But when there's symptoms of insomnia, nervousness, disinterest, androgen deficit syndrome is there, tibolone can be a good option. It has shown itself to be superior to conventional HT in women with surgical menopause. All those people where you are knocking off your ovaries because free. knock off the uterus, knock off the ovaries and then they'll come right back to you with hot flashes. And there you can uh, use your tibolone. It can be an alternative to conventional HT for the treatment of postmenopausal women with sexuality changes. Uh, so, other reasons, benefits, 
with MHT. You start it for hot flashes, but the extra benefits that you get is less joint pain and stiffness. You can get down to the stage faster, get down faster. A preclinical study suggests that possible benefit is there in preventing muscle loss. So you want to open a, a bottle, you ask the younger person to do, you don't have to do that. If you take your MHT for hot flashes, you can open the bottle without the help of a youngster. Obesity and weight gain decreases and reduction in colorectal malignancy and neutral effect on lung cancer. So how long can you use premature menopause up to the natural age of menopause? Natural menopause, the safety data is there for three to five years, for God's sake. And after that, who wants to take it anyway? And with estrogen only, safety data is there for seven years. So don't get scared of MHT. So very severe hot flashes, mostly five years is enough. But please do follow up the patient one month, three months, six months. Look at the weight, blood pressure. Look at her as a patient. Look after her. Six monthly, do her lipid profile, hormone profile, clotting profile, breast examination, mammography, all that. Two to three years, as you would do for any person, pap smear, mammogram has to be done every three years. But whenever your woman comes with hot flashes, please don't jump to a conclusion because it's the easiest thing to diagnose. It can also happen in if a patient is on calcium channel blockers. Every alternate woman is taking something like that for hypertension. Diltiacin, niacin, raloxifen, clomiphene citrate, nitroglycerin, calcitonin. If a woman has got serious diseases like thyrotoxicosis, you may be the first one to diagnose it. You think it is hot flashes, but it may be thyroid problem. That's why you need to examine a patient properly. You know? So there can be other uh, instances of hot flashes also where you just pop... Um, MHT the, to the patient, but she's actually suffering from something else. COVID, you had to be careful. These slides were made during COVID time. Anyway, Bazidoxifen is the next one. It's not available here. No, it's actually a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And uh, it's a tissue selective estrogen complex. It retains the efficiency of estrogen, but does not stimulate the endometrium or the breast. So it's one up on the progesterone, so you don't need to give that. So you give 0.45 milligram of estrogen. That will take care of your hot flashes. You're not giving it 0.625, so you're lowering the dose of estrogen. The side effects of estrogen will be less. And you add to that this bazidoxifen. So both together, hot flashes will be properly dealt with. You won't get breast cancer. Your bones are solved, uh, looked after. And so it's one up on the conventional MHT. But it's very costly. So, yeah, it's still coming. Now, again, uh, everybody asks this question. Premature menopause, young girl coming 40-year-old. What is the difference between HRT and OC pills? I already explained. The OC pills has got four times more estrogen. And if possible, you are supposed to use the MHT and not the OC pill. But, yes, it's easier to give COCs. Young girl, so what if you give COCs? I wouldn't say it's absolutely a no-no. So, what about diabetes? MHT is definitely, uh, you know, it can decrease your glucose levels, increase your, uh, decrease your fasting insulin. It can reduce your obesity. So, it's it's definitely allowed to give MHT in diabetes, but do not give in unexplained vaginal bleeding, stroke, TIA, MI, pulmonary embolism. Breast of endometrial cancer, we have a lot of breast cancer survivors who are coming there. If they are estrogen receptor positive and they really have real bad hot flashes, many of them are on letrozole for a lifetime and they will beg you to give them estrogen. But yeah, it's better to give them venlafaxine or something like that uh, because you have to find alternatives. Polystasis and hepatic adenoma, SLE, there is an increased risk of flares, porphyrias, uh, you won't even diagnose it. It's actually a condition where you'll have abdominal pain, chest pain with all these rashes. And it won't come to your mind. But if that patient has got that, then you can't give MHT. can exacerbate the attack. Endometriosis, even if you knock off the ovaries, there are endometrial implants around, you know. So you have to give your progesterones. This is one patient where even after hysterectomy, you have to start giving progesterone. Or you can give tibolone. Because otherwise, uh, it's like creating premature menopause. Huh? So you have to give it. 
and uh, you have to give it up to the natural age of menopause even in fibroids basically the fibroids may increase in size but what happens is after the you stop the therapy it will come back to the same size and it will not cause symptoms so this is the study that uh, they have done that in the third year the increase was not marked and it doesn't affect the patient. So you are really allowed to give HMG even if she's got one or two fibroids. So you don't have to really do a hysterectomy for a patient with hot flashes if she comes with fibroids. Of course, it's easier for us to do the hysterectomy and give MHT, but studies have shown that it's not necessary. So the risk the risk of getting cardiovascular events is definitely reduced with estrogen therapy. That's what the Framingham study has shown. In hypertension, it's not a contraindication to be MHD. There is a study which has studied. They have actually done the 24-hour blood pressure uh, testing. I don't know how can they get so many women to study. I don't know. But they have been testing them 24-hour BP and they found that the... But BP, 19 such studies have found that there was no effect on BP. And some studies even said that it's even improving the hypertension. So as long as you're not using COCs, MHT is definitely good for hypertensive people. But just because heart failure is there, it's not a contraindication. Because in the study with patients who are having heart failure, they divided them into two groups. And one group, were taking MHT, the other was not taking MHT, and the ones who were taking MHT, lesser number of people had died, that is 21% died, in the other group who were not on MHT, 34% died. So there is definitely no contraindication, but primary indication to prevent CVS, you should not be giving it. So, so far, HRT given in a perimenopausal women can be good for the heart, HRT safe, HRT started for the first time in a woman, more than 10 years postmenopausal can be detrimental. Hysterectomize women more than 55 years. Again, you can't start after 55. Uh, Lipid-friendly progesterones are better to use. And suppose I had a patient with diabetes and sepsis and diabetes was not getting controlled. You know, she had cholesterol also. And she was going on saying it's all because of the 2 centimeters of serous fibroid. She had hot flashes. Here, trans estrogen and progesterones were prescribed and she was rich and that was much better and your diabetes can be controlled much better once your tensions are gone you know migraine migraine generally reduces after menopause but if you want to give hrt with hot flashes you give a continuous regimen instead of giving your sequential regimen that will be better because uh, absence of variations of hormones is that is necessary because it's the variations that cause the migraine and if you give a continuous regimen the variations won't be there and you will be okay even in migraine you can try it out if she's really badly symptomatic so irritable bowel syndrome you can have irregular absorption you never think of it no why the patient is getting irregular bleeding she's on antibiotics she will have poor absorption of drugs because of increased motion and then she'll come with irregular bleeding. And you will forget that she's on, she's having cough and you've been giving her antibiotics. All these small, small things also can be there. Thrombocytopenia, warfarin, how many women are on warfarin, all these people, if you give, irregular bleeding can be there. So I, this, again, antibiotic, I told you, intestinal hurry. Asthma, there is a small increase, but no worsening of pre-existing disease. So anybody on inhalers can take MHT. Uh, Parkinson's disease improves, but only for that you can't give. Renal failure, you can give. And post bone marrow transplant, they are all going to be increasing in number all these days. And uh, they are all really having hot flashes and you may be called to give it. Post renal hepatic transplant patients are also going to be there. Rheumatoid arthritis is another place where you are going to be called in. Thyroid disease is not contraindicated. Although thyroid, uh, you know, uh, level decreases when you are on MHT. So I think I'll stop here because they, either you're getting bored or I've exceeded my time. Anyway, thank you for this short duration of a talk. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your excellent talk. Uh, at the last moment, 
uh, you accepted our invitation and we are highly thankful to you for that. Thank you, Dr. Monica. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monica, ma'am. And thank you, Vrinda, ma'am, for sharing the session. Ma'am, it was indeed an exhaustive presentation. and I am sure the delegates must have had a very good uh, take-home message from this. Uh, I would now request uh, Shatabdi to please carry on with the next academic session. Thank you, Monica. Uh, thank you, ma'am, once again. It was indeed a very nice lecture and thank you for expect, accept, accepting our invitation. Thank you, last Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, we'll now move on to our next session. Our next session is a panel discussion on AUB in perimenopausal age group. Uh, we have uh, we have two excellent moderators and a very good uh, team of panelists with us. Our two moderators for the day are Dr. Gorak Mandrukar, sir, and Dr. Minu Agarwal, ma'am. Dr. Gorak Mandrukar is an IVF consultant at Angel IVF Clinic, Wakad, Pune. He's also the vice president of Gestosis India Association. Uh, welcome, Gorak, sir. Uh, Minu Ma'am is the president of the Pune Obsgyni Society and the elected secretary general of the International Society of Gynecological Endoscopy. Uh, she has various awards to her credit. Welcome, Minu Ma'am. Uh, our expert for the panel is Suvarna Ma'am. Suvarna Ma'am is the professor and head of department of OBGYN consultant at Bombay Hospital uh, Institute of Medical Sciences uh, at Mumbai. Uh, Ma'am will try to join, but I guess she is in a meeting at Hyderabad. So she might not be able to join. However, we're looking forward to her joining. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, our panelists for the day, uh, we have 10 panelists with us. Firstly, we have Dr. Rashmi Kahar, ma'am. Uh, ma'am is the organizing secretary, has been the organizing secretary of Amogas, uh, Amogs 2020. She's also the uh, secretary of the Amravati Obsgyni okay. Society. Welcome, Rashmi, ma'am. Our next panelist is Dr. Sujit Konkar. Uh, Dr. Sujit Konkar is a practicing consultant at Aurangabad. And uh, he is also the chairperson of the Fetal Medicine Committee of AMOX. Uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, Sujit. Our next panelist is Dr. Renu Setia, ma'am. Ma'am is the director of Bombay Hospital and Maternity Home, Hanumangarh Junction. Welcome, Renu, ma'am. Uh, next is Dr. Aditi Rathod, ma'am. Ma'am is the consultant of at Rathod Nursing Home. Uh, ma'am has also been the organizing team at AMPOGS uh, 2018, faculty at various secretary uh, uh, national and state conferences. And the Secretary of ROGS. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Uh, next is Dr. Shabana Sultan, ma'am. She is the professor in Department of Obs and Gyne at GMC Bhopal. Uh, she has presented various programs, uh, various papers in national and international conferences. Welcome, Shabana, ma'am. Uh, next is Dr. Bajrang Lal, sir. Uh, sir is a professor and head uh, at Government Medical College, Shikhar. Also the president of the Shekhawati Obs and Gynecological Society. Welcome, sir. Next is Dr. B.S. Jodha, sir. Uh, sir is a senior professor in Obsgani, of course, in Dr. SN Medical College, Jodhpur, Rajasthan. Uh, and uh, he he has been, he has various awards to her to his credit and is the secretary of uh, JOGOS. Welcome, sir. Uh, next is Dr. Darshan Wadekar. Dr. Darshan is the president of the Surat Obsgani Society and a gynecologist uh, and a fetal medicine specialist at Surat. Welcome, Dr. Darshan. Next is Dr. Sunita Vadwan, Vadwani, ma'am. Ma'am is the president of Ratlam Obsgyni Society as well as the director and consultant of Ratlam Hospital and Research Center. Welcome, Sunita, ma'am. Last but not the least, we have Dr. Monica, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Monica Singh, ma'am, is a professor at LN Medical College, Bhopal, consultant reproductive medicine at Bhopal Fertility and Endoscopic Center, as well as the honorary secretary of the MP, ISAR, uh, MP chapter of ISAR uh, in the year 2023-24. Welcome, Monica, ma'am. I now hand it over to Minu, ma'am, and Gorak, sir, for uh, for carrying out the panel and looking forward to an excellent discussion. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shatabdi. That was very nice the way you presented <laughs> everyone. Thank you so much. I will share my screen. Um, so just give me a minute. Okay. Can you see my screen? No, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We can see, but it's a white no, screen. No, ma'am. Not seen yet. Go next. Can you see it? No, no. actually you no. have shared the white screen, not your presentation. Uh, I'm sharing the presentation. Yes, uh, stop the presentation once and I'm share it once again, please. Okay. All right. Um, Ma'am, can I stop share from my end? Uh, oh, yes, you have to stop share from your Maybe that is why I'm not yes, able to. Yes, yes. Now uh, try it once more, ma'am. 
Yes, ma'am. Make it full okay. screen. Great. Perfect. Uh, ma'am, uh, we are seeing that iCloud storage screen, not your presentation. Oh my God! Why like that? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm sharing again. It will come till then. I welcome all panelists. And uh, uh, we are uh, actually, it was a last minute invitation. So I was not prepared, but uh, whatever prepared, we are going to present in front of you all. And uh, we are going to discuss today mainly the abnormal uterine breeding in perimenopausal age group. And we all know there are. Um, uh, three, four important topics. Screen, no? not, we are seeing the same screen. Okay, I'll mm -hmm. log out and log in again. Sometime that works. Give me a minute. Okay, give me a minute. I'll log like, out and log yeah. in again. Okay, like Mangal Vision. <laughs> Vision yeah. Mangal. Right. So till then, uh, we'll discuss that. Yes, there are a few issues we all know, and we have present tried to present only three cases. And in those three cases, we will try to cover the whole abnormal uterine breeding in the perimenopausal age group. Um, so, let Madam join. Sir, we missed you at Ratlam. You were wanting. Yeah, <laughs> Actually, I was going to come, but I was uh, on 13,000 feet. Whenever <laughs> you are comfortable, we'll be loving to I mean, ha have yeah. you here in Ratlam. Definitely, yes. yes I was fortunate that I was there at Annapurna Base Camp. Ji, sir, and, we saw uh, your recording from that place and it was <laughs> uh, we could feel the uh, temperature out there. <laughs> right. Just to, yeah, today morning only I have come. Ji, sir. And, yeah. Girish sir happens to be my senior. He was immediate senior oh. to me in my college times. Great, great, great. So I may I may I request uh, Dr. Jodha sir uh, that sir uh, can you just please uh, um, just give the brief information? Ki, uh, how many cases we are nowadays looking? Uh, because you are you have great seniority. So what is the percentage that previously what was the perimenopausal? abnormal uterine bleeding and is there any change nowadays in the perimenopausal age group AUB? So may I request Dr. Jodha sir. Sir unmute, unmute please. Uh, we are not able to hear you sir. Voice is coming. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so nowadays we are getting good number of cases because of patients' awareness. Previously, the patients were suffering there. What uh, type of medications available in their vicinity? Uh, whether homemade preparations, whether quacks, and every sort of practices are there still in the. Um, the area in which we are residing is still practice and we are getting these patients in three grams and four grams and five grams reaching to us uh, uh, just taking some jar folk and tabis and that like this is because of some god's disgrace so these are the situation but the educated people they are reaching or the peripheral centers which they are uh, having their access, they are reaching to us because of referral. They have tried many sort of uh, preparations available like hemostatic they have given, injectables they have given, hormones they have given, still patient is in trouble. So these uh, cases are reporting to us in form of various structural uh, problems of AUB or there the facility of sonography is there, getting some uh, abnormal structure problem in form of polyps, uh, fibroids, or like that, or abnormal architecture of uterus. So they, these patients with sonography report are reporting to us, and 
so they the number is good because still we are getting uh, 15 20% of our opd patients who are coming any sorts of irregular form of bleeding right. whether uh, which may be other younger patients or in even perimenopausal age group patients right so i think sir has rightly pointed out that ki the incidence is almost same only thing is ki the awareness has increased and that's why the number of patients who are attending these aub opds and uh, as sir has rightly said that the treatment modalities diagnostic modalities are now e- easily available and that's why we are feeling that the ra problem is increasing but uh, sir has rightly pointed out that yes it was there and uh, it will be there so we have to be very uh, careful about it uh, when, sorry excuse me when i'm sharing the screen it is only sharing uh, the right screen i don't know why is there some should, uh, should i, I start a backup i have a backup can i share on your behalf uh, you can do that but i had made some nice changes oh so yeah everything so let actually, me actually dr minu has uh, she has added so many good videos for very yes. interesting presentation yes so yeah. but why is why is it showing white board i don't know mm-hmm. madam you can just mail your ppt to the person he will share for you Ah, yeah, that can be. We will not get the. Abhishek, you already have the PPT with you. Please yes, share ma'am. it, no? Yes, okay. ma'am. I have ma'am. shared. Shared to ma'am also. No, nee, Monika, madam. Only problem is that the changes which uh, Dr. Minu has done, uh, so she I... wanted actually in those. That's why. Ma'am, you can uh, just share it uh, to Abhishek. He will share. Uh, he will share the right. slides with. Right. Till then, we will have the discussion. Yes, uh, Dr. Yes. Sunita, madam. may i request you minu ma'am uh, i am share, uh, share uh, you can uh, comfortable on whatsapp or mail ma'am minu ma'am no i am comfortable on whatsapp also yeah so, ma'am so i am sharing my number no but my my presentation is on my laptop so oh. i have oh. so ma'am if you can mail him mail he will share his email id right now right videos may not go but i will share right. yeah till then we'll have so surita madam um do you think that the incidence of adenomyosis or fibroids is increasing nowadays yes sir or, uh, we can uh, and what uh, can we do adeno- adenomyosis was never diagnosed before because it used to be diagnosed it used to be a post operative diagnosis initially mm-hmm. nowadays we have sonographies which can tell us that adenomyosis is there and lately the gynecologists are doing sonography so they are more into doing transvaginal sonography and that gets adenomyosis caught very easily okay right uh, uh aditi madam uh my question is that uh, good evening sir right good evening good evening Now, to everyone yeah so the, the what is the acceptance of uh, the modern modality like uh, lng ius in your practice okay what was previous and what is now the lng ius what is the acceptance sir so the where i am practicing in jawra it is close to ratlam a very small place so i have been telling patients to go for lng ius but they are not going for it basically at my place as jodha sir was earlier saying that in the periphery still they are being treated by quacks and they are taking progesterone on and off so most of the patients here i have my stock of mirena has expired let me tell oh. you yes so basically here when i tell the at the very practically speaking so when i tell the patient you have to go for a device which has to be inserted in your uterus so they take uh-huh. it like kopati upar chala jayega niche chala jayega so they normally they prefer going for a hysterectomy here at periphery basically but uh, at ratlam dr dolly madam ma'am has used a lot of lng ius devices close to 100 i think we'll go with your presentation which you shared with me because this is a big file with the videos So it is not going through the mail as well. I I, I will share my presentation. Yeah, you share that. I don't know why it is showing white board. Now is it okay? Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. So, Madam, Madam, may I request you to uh, go ahead? Yes. All right. So, um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Monica and the entire team for uh, having us and the Corona team for organizing this uh, webinar. Very nice lectures that we have had, and now we are coming to another challenge. And what are challenges are making our life interesting? And when we 
cross over that challenge, we overcome that challenge, we really feel that we have succeeded and we have given something back to the society. So that is how we are, uh, yeah. So you can uh, keep changing right. this. So, <laughs> right. so, so what we feel is that ki whenever we are dealing with any problem, then the three things come in our mind. Ki, uh, what is the peer's observation? What are the evidences and what are the guidelines? And moreover, as sir was pointing out, ki, yes, the experience, because it matters a lot. Because not always the guidelines, they may be pertaining to the particular area. So there can be a problem of ethnicity, there can be the problem of genetics, there can be a problem of geographical variation. So even the experience, the evidence guideline and all, they should take into uh, consideration. Over right. So yes, so um, before we uh, start, I think we will welcome our panelists, Dr. Rashmi Kahar, Dr. Sujit Kondka, Dr. Renu Setia, Dr. Aditi Rathor, Dr. Shabana Sultan, Dr. Monica Singh, Dr. Sunita Vadhwani, Dr. Darshan Vadekar, Dr. B.S. Jodha and Dr. Bajrang Lal sir. So I think all of them are very, very senior. Um, many of them are HODs of the government medical colleges. So thank you very much uh, for being here. And uh, first of all, we, uh, we are discussing about AUB, abnormal uterine bleeding. So first thing I would like to ask, uh, anyone can answer, uh, how do you define or what is the palm coin classification, FIGO classification of uh, AUB? Anybody can answer the question or we can discuss it and take it forward. All this was in my slides, but unfortunately those slides are not seen. So that is why I will be asking of the slides. So when I, I talk about, yes, sure. Um, coin classification is usually the re reason for AUV. The abnormal uterine bleeding is increased in uterine bleeding or uh, increased duration of bleeding or maybe increase uh, shorter cycles. And according to the uh, that short form of palm is structural defects which leads to AU AUV. And coin would be uh, the non-structural reasons for AUV. The first first part would be the point uh, palm that would be. Uh, the polyp, that is P, A is for adenomyces, L is for leomyomas, and M would be for malignancies. All these are the structural reasons which are responsible for uh, AUB. And the non-structural ones would be, uh, that is the coin. C, C stands for uh, co uh, your uh, coagulation. Co uh, coagulation profile. O stands for ovarian reasons of AUB, the bleeding disorders related to ovaries. Then E would be standing for endometrial reasons of AUB. Uh, then again, I would be iatrogenic reasons like copper tea or maybe some other drugs which are being given, warfarin or something, which would lead, lead to abnormal bleedings. And N would be non-specific, in which uh, the um, AB malformations kind of pictures would be coming in. Excellent. I mean, I think that's a good learning take home message also for the students, because they need to learn all these classifications. Um, we can go to the next slide now. For a... right. So let us start with the cases. So my first case is, uh, she's a 46 year old male, and she comes with uh, heavy and painful periods. But as Sarah as said, ki they, they were at home. And so she has complaints, all these complaints since last two years. Her cycles are, she's bleeding for five to six days and she has polyvinorrhea maybe by 18 to 23 days. Now her hemoglobin is nine, vitals are stable and weight is 70 kg. And when we did the sonography, we found that her uterus is uniformly enlarged, almost a size of 10, seven into six. And then myomatium shows the mortal in homogeneous texture with small cystic spaces Endometrium is shaggy, 9 mm, right over has small hemorrhagic cyst, and rest is normal. So, this is somehow the picture. Okay, uh, the, we can say the diagrammatic, and this is actual sonography, which showed that distorted uh, uterine cavity, and this is something area. So, our diagnosis is, uh, of course, endomyosis. Yes. Now, what further investigations we should do? 
anybody can take the question. Dr. Sunitha, madam, please. Yeah, first, first is history taking. Proper history taking is a must, sir, in any any AUB. And after history taking, we, I mean, in history, we have to uh, have particular questions like if they had some PPH in the uh, uh, some surgical bleeds, uh, some gum bleeds, bruises, or anything. All those things should come. Specific questions should come in the history. And then we should, after taking history, we should do a proper examination of that patient. Proper examination. Uh, every patient should be done a PS and PV examination. That should be a gold standard by examining a patient. And after that, we ask them for various blood investigations and the uh, sonography, the um, screening test for what, what is the reason for a UB. To start with, I would definitely do the blood investigation, which would show us what is the hemoglobin of the patient, what is BT, CT, PT, INR of the patient. And then I would go for sonography. Anybody right. So here we have, we have done the sonography, we have done the blood investigations. Okay. Now diagnosis is in front of you. So would anybody also go for the thyroid profile for the patient? Yes, yes, sir. yes, yes ma'am. Right. Because again, that is very important, Mini Madam has said that because the hypothyroidism again, not only in pregnancy, but overall the incidence of hypothyroidism is increased. And maybe it has a different geographical variations. But uh, if you see in Maharashtra, it is 20 to 22%. If you see in Telangana or in Jammu Kashmir, it is going up to more than 35%. So she is very uh, right that we have to have that thyroid profile as well. Yes. Uh, now the diagnosis is very clear that patient is having uh, uh, adenomyosis. We all know the ATO pathogenesis and all. So how to manage this case? Because we have done the endometrial aspiration and it has shows that there is a secretory endometrium. So what is your impression now and how will you manage the case? Uh, Aditi, madam. Yes, sir, because now the patient is 46 years of age. So uh, I would like to start her on Maybe progesterones first and for first and foremost. So, uh, but the, after doing all the initial investigations, maybe progesterones. Uh, uh, we can start with NSAIDs or COCs also. But I would like to because she's forty six years which I'll put her on a short trial for progesterones. Or maybe I would like to take her on uh, mifepristone also. And if the as we earlier discussed the the, the choice according to these days is. Uh, LNIGS, so I might even ask her for Mirena, but I can give her, her options. Basically, she will fall into a medical management category and uh, okay. initially, but the patient has to be counseled first that these are your symptoms and these are the features. So, uh, first of all, I will offer her any medical management which will uh, relate to her symptoms, which is pain and bleeding. So, if she first I'll put her on, in my practice, I'll put her on a short course of progesterone, advise her that she might go for LNG IUS if she wants to. Though in my uh, And basically in my practice, I am going with Mifepristone or Lloyd, 25 milligram per day for six months. Right. Okay. So Madam has pointed out about medical management. Uh, Mini Madam, what we would like to add regarding the Mifepristone? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, what you, uh, Dr. Aditi, whatever you said, I think it fits very well for the patient's management. Uh, I would also go for something similar, but uh, we can also give the options to the patient. Uh, sometimes we may miss a small little polyp sitting there. So maybe a good uh, either scanning or an office hysteroscopy. Sir, probably. Uh, yes, yes ma'am. I would like to add that though we have done a sonography, but the diagnostic modality of choice is basically MRI. Oh. Basically. Mm. What I've read. <laughs> So I have never done a but the basically it should be done and yes of course as Mama said office sisters to rule out any other polyp and that uh, polyp right. office hysteroscopy karke usko nikal diya ye yeah, adenomyosis can cause menorrhagia but if she also has dysmenorrhea if she also has dysperunia generally histis, history of previous curettages uh, adenomyosis earlier we used to think is seen more in Paris women as compared to endometriosis which is seen in infertility women. But nowadays, we are seeing a lot of adenomyosis even in infertility patients. So we have yes. to keep, uh, you know, this even at an, uh, this thing in mind. However, because she is 
uh, already para 2 and she is 46 years of age and we can see an adeno, adenomyosis there in the uterus. I think progesterone management uh, is a good option or a Mirena is, seems like a hysteroscopy followed by Mirena. Seems like a good option yeah. to be given to the patient. Yeah. Who is already 46 <laughs> years of age yes. with the uh, abnormal uh, uterine bleeding she has reported. It is first to do the endometrial biopsy Whatever yes. may be the reason, we have to be on 40 years of age with abnormal uterine bleeding. It is the protocol to follow. And that if is. endometrial biopsy, you have a uh, choice of hysteroscopic guided, then it is better. You can diagnose and take a sample. Or at least you had excluded by the secretory endometrium that already has been done. So you have excluded the endometrial disease. And now the choice is mostly nowadays we are preferring to give the LNG IUS for these patients and they are responding very well to these and we have yes. prevented many stectomies these patients. Can so, I add something? Yes, so I think, yes sure. Marika, Marika. Uh, What I wanted to just comment on MRI, MRI would definitely not be the line of investigation you would uh, suggest because uh, uh, of just, you know, uh, upfront because a 3D USG, uh, you know, uh, sections in a 3D mm -hmm which is available nowadays to most in most of the good machines gives us a pretty uh, accurate estimation of the adenomyoma, the location. And just yesterday, I was seeing a patient with gross adenomyosis. I was teaching to one of my students. And as soon as I went to the right ovary, there was a huge endometrium also. So uh, this was in a 42-year-old woman. So that endometrium was sitting along with the huge adenomyoma. So sometimes, you know, just, just, giving time to a good scan, like it was told in Prashant sir's lecture. We have to give time yeah. to our machine. The machine has not got to be an ornament in our hospital. It has to be used effectively and it can reveal so many things. MRI is basically for fibroid mapping, for those cases where you're planning a surgery, you want to know where to put your incision. And uh, yeah, one more practical thing I was just going to speak about. One of my patients with gross adenomyosis, where I tried putting LNG IUS, she had a very much, you know, uh, increased UCL. And I had difficulty put, putting the uh, this thing, uh, Mirena. And I had to remove it after a year because she did not stop bleeding. Uh, there were patches of endometrium uh, which uh, that uh, LNG was not able to release enough of progesterone to control the uh, bleeding. Uh, ultimately, she went for a MAP uh, hysterectomy. Right. So, till now, I can enumerate the very good take-home messages which were given by the all expert panelists. Number one, that per speculum and per vaginal examination is a must, which the youngsters now, day by day, they are actually not doing and they are directly going for TVS and uh, what not investigations. So that is the one first take home message. Second take home message that as sir has rightly said that because she is uh, near towards the perimenopause. So endometrial aspiration, biopsy or sampling that is must. And what Dr. Minu has added very well that hysteroscopy guided if we do then definitely the sensitivity and the specificity of our diagnosis will increase. And along with that, if we go ahead with the LNG IUS, then probably it is a best method. But only the concern what Dr. Monica has shown that is absolutely right. So it is, um, again, uh, uh, there was a very good uh, study which has shown that if we give a trial of levonorgestrel for one month prior to the LNG IUS, and if we are successful enough to see that whether the bleeding goes down, then probably Mirena or the LNG IUS will act better. So I think these are the take-home messages which till now we have got. Now I can another, ask Dr. Rar, sir. Point, another yes, point please. I would like to add here, since it is a FOXI meeting and FOXI has yes. given good practice clinical guidelines. Yes. Yes. They have very clearly mentioned. Thank you, Monica, for asking me to read those guidelines. Yeah. More than 40 years of age, all patients with AUB and endometrial biopsy should be done, like uh, Sir said, Jodha Sir said. Less than 40 years, you should do an endometrial biopsy if she is at high risk. She's obese, she's hypertensive, she has been having PCO, or she has a family history of any malignancies, CA breast, CA endometrium, CA ovary, CA colon. So all these patients uh, should undergo 
even under the age of 40 years, they should undergo. These are the good pra practice clinical guidelines by Foxy. So that is, uh, I wanted to point out. Right. So may I ask uh, Dr. Rar, sir, Dr. B.L. Rar, sir, that uh, what uh, what is about the Mifepristone? Because much, much was said, and though it is not yet come into the recommendations, uh, can we use Mifepristone in such patients? Will it help in adenomyosis? B.L. Rar, sir. Is sir here? Uh, yes, it can, uh, it can help in adenomyosis. And we are, but but we are working in the government set, setting, right? So okay. there is my, we cannot prescribe drugs from outside. <laughs> so we it's cannot use these two yes. drugs. We, we have only okay. drugs which are available in a hospital. We can prescribe only these drugs. Right. So public and private, uh, there can be the difference. Yes, Monica Gupta, madam, can you comment on that? Maybe uh, what is the usage and you know, is it, is it, uh, uh, okay. uh, we are using Mifepristone mainly for the fibroids right okay. now because in the fibroid we are getting a very good result and right. moreover it is going to give a mean amenorrhea for three months so Absolutely. it is going to help in adenomyosis also and many a time okay. both of them coexist adenomyosis with fibroid so we can right. get the result and whatever we are giving the we have to suppress the estrogen receptors so I right. think it is going to help it out but uh, for the adenomyosis, we are using the Dynogest mainly. Okay. Both are working on the same point, creating an amenorrhea and decreasing the size of adenoma. Right. So, so is he using letrozole, Dr. Monica Singh? Anybody using letrozole? A lot of people ah, yeah. have come now 5 milligram daily letrozole for 3 months. Really? Uh, Letrozole, I have not used, madam, but the recent there was a very good study which stated the re reduction in the uterine size. Actually, we are not discussing fibroid here, but uh, in a patient with myomas, if you give a patient three months course of letrozole, vis a vis three months course of, uh, sorry, uh, ulipristal versus mifepristone, the reduction in the fibroid volume, the size, was greater with ulipristal. But because of the side effects, it has gone into disrepute. I think the biggest being the hepatic. Ma'am, letrozole, I don't have first-hand experience, but I really want to start it because of the volume of cases we are doing. And all these therapies are actually just to buy time, either before surgery or for the anemia to improve or for the hemoglobin levels to rise or before the patient makes up a mind for surgery. They are not definitive therapies or for a perimenopausal patient to go into menopause. Even that transition period can be covered by Mifepristone, Letrozole, or Ulipristone. Fantastic. But that line was very fantastic. You said that this medical management is, yes, really it is not definitive. And really we have to have some time and that's why we are using it. It is absolutely right. So now we will move to this conservative surgical treatment. If suppose the patient has not responded, not responded to the medical management and or the adenomyosis is very huge. So, in which cases we should go for debulking or cytoreductive surgeries? I have and, nice uh, because of this in my presentation. Uh, that's why actually <laughs> Dr. Menu has a very good uh, video of laparoscopy <laughs> on this. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. unfortunately, but I, I I will share it with you at and in and yeah. some other webinar, no yeah. problem. Yeah. So, any, anybody can put a focus on this uh, debulking or cytoreductive surgeries where they are required in adenomyosis, and uh, does it really help? Anybody can put. The patient who is already 46 years of age and our aim is not to do the debulking if she has completed all the uh, family family or obstetric area of yeah. her, then yes. uh, yeah. these procedures uh, may be avoided if possible. If patient wants to conjure her uterus and suffering from this disease, then it, these can be tried and they are very effective because it is sometimes the localized adenomyoma if you uh, resect it out and the results are good in best hands where the you can repair the uterine wall or you can oppose the uterine wall properly with the stitching if possible or various yeah. techniques which are available to uh, remove the right. most so of the adenomyotic tissue the patient's response are 
good better so in yeah. our area patients are before they come to our hospital they have already consulted at least 10 non medical people and got their sonography read by them and googled it and they don't right. want to ask you what treatment are you supposed to give they just come and tell you that ab ye ho gaya hai and this is not going to improve that is what we know and ab bahut time nahi waste karna hai we want a hysterectomy and if okay. they convince them that hysterectomy is not the only thing that can be done we have many more things to do they would go to somebody nearby and do their hysterectomy and they would come to you and aapko nahi aati thi isliye aapne nahi kiya that is what they do but this is the challenge is for us you know we are we okay. are not biased with these people who come and say do the hysterectomy we have to avoid it because of the we patient who is doing that sir. if yes. the patient is having adenomyosis and if we are able to keep that patient with you for next 6 months with lng ius system i can say that at least 50% of patients will be with uh, good results with 6 months of lng ius system itself only whatever may be the cause of this it may be a fibroid a small fibroid maybe adenomyosis it may be only ovulatory dysfunction so this system has change the scenario in last 15 years where we are using this system and uh, getting good results of it and avoiding so, 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 so but for Madam, conservative no. surgeries we have to take the uh, consent for hysterectomy also if it is not okay. if anything happens so then patient says ki ma'am jab when you have to do a hysterectomy you do it right away because she is already 46 completed her family and going for a conservative surgery opening up everything you if you are doing a laparoscopy also you can go for a laparoscopic hysterectomy and all because uh, convincing for the medical management is easier because we can say ki we are going to save your uterus but when we are going for the conservative surgery in the patient who has com- already completed the family it's i think it's very difficult because whenever you are operating you have to take the consent for hysterectomy and then he she says ki madam jo aapko hysterectomy hi karni hai so why don't you do directly why are you going for the conservative surgery first and then going for the hysterectomy i mean that is a practical problem yeah dr monica i, I think we both of us totally agree with you conservative surgery probably will be a good option where the patient wants to retain her reproductive function or she is very very clear that she wants her menstruation to continue she does not want a hysterectomy at all so those are i think will be reserved only for those patients mm-hmm. if she is finished her family and uh, nothing else is working rather than a conservative surgical management i think a tlh is much faster much easier uh, to do as compared to uh, dd bulking surgery i I, i agree with you on this go yeah, and here na yeah yeah here here again i would like to give the message that, that ki, thank you very much the public awareness committee we have great work that we have to do a lot of work on lng ius and to remove the myths and the misconceptions and uh, we should thank dr priyankur and dr monika umardhan as well for arranging this and dr aditi i think whenever we will come in that area we will do some public awareness program because this is i think required because you said very sadly that my stock of the lng ius has expired yes sir i have offered oh, free of yeah. cost also i have told patients i'll not charge anything you get it <laughs> If any time there's such situations no, arises, you can. Ma'am, I just disagree. Is, many of the <laughs> LNG, I will put it. Patients, if we consult properly, even I am working in a small city, Alwar near Rajas in the Rajasthan, and we are little bit backward in everything. But the people are accepting it. Today only I have inserted one uh, mirena, and within a month I insert two or three mirena per month. because you have to counsel them ki instead of taking medicines for so long aapka you have to uh, spend so much of the uh, money on coming and going and spending on the medicines and taking the medicine regularly why not you just insert a mirena it will hardly cost you 5000 rupees and everything will be many things will be taken care of and people are opting for 4, it i think counseling is very 4, important mm-hmm. from the part of the doctor No, we are agreeing, madam. You yes, but, ma'am. Uh, at the I same agree. time, the practical yes, practically many at many places. What madam Aditi has said, in at many places, madam, there are myths. Okay, whenever we put something inside the uterus, it may pierce and it may because I have done personally even study and that study was called as T. 
T means she. Okay. So what we have done, ki we, we have gone to the lady and we have asked ki who told you that this will cause a problem. She said ki she has told you. So <coughs> tell her name. Actually, okay. ma'am, Alwar is a very big city. Where I am working, okay. it is a small tehsil. Alwar is not a small place. Alwar is a big place. So we are, we are, we are working in a tehsil place. It is actually a very small place. But ma'am, do you try? You will yeah, definitely get my stock ready here in my OPD. I can show you the stock with me. Then not maybe the fault lies with the doctor. But what uh -huh. they believe, as Madam Madhwani just said, they prefer getting a hysterectomy done. You refuse them because it is very easy to discuss. As Sir Gorak said, public awareness is a must. It is very easy when we have the guidelines. Yes, we will discuss high fu and uterine artery embolization. But it is patients think hardly these punches are open. There's a hub here, but where they get hysterectomies done for 20,000 rupees. So they would prefer going there and getting a hysterectomy done rather than bearing the cost of all the drugs. And because the Asha Karakarta is a male culprit, but all said and done, I understand the counseling has to be done. The fault lies with the doctor, and I'll try harder. And when we started our practice, a common delivery was very a rare thing. People used to say, why you we have to come for a normal delivery in the hospital. Now the scenario has changed because of the awareness. And uh, when we all will work together, we all and will when the government, the, the government the sector will, will put, uh, endorse LN, uh, LNG IUS, then only it will work. Huh. The government they, sector are like giving, they are giving LNG IUS in, in uh, Rajasthan. Even in, they are in, coming in the government supply also. So the scenario okay. will change. Definitely so, we have to work hard for it. Yes, yes, we have to work hard and I can give here assurance because myself and Dr. Minu Agarwal, we both are here, the candidates for the vice president of the Foxy next year. Uh, and uh, I think we What's should take here? this. <laughs> yeah, no, that's why I said candidates. And I think our motto actually is the same because uh, we are both are not uh, politically and something, but, but yes, really we want to work something. And my motto is to have the medical legally correct gynecologist. And second is we should say no to the hist unnecessary hysterectomies. So if because, with this uh, motto we to, together all work, definitely, yes. So we are going towards the case two. Uh, may I request Minu Madam to conduct this case? So uh, case this, she's a 58 years old lady. Uh, complains of some spotting three days ago. Menopause at the age of 50 years. Earlier cycles were regular. She's had para 2 last delivery 26 years ago. She does not have any hypertension, diabetes, tubuc no history of tuberculosis. She, there is no, I mean, her thyroids are normal. No family history of any malignancy. She's mildly paler. PP is okay, normal. Weight 65 kilos. Per speculum done, normal. Per vaginum, PV done, normal. Breasts are normal. There is no evidence of any vaginitis on per speculum. What next will you do? Yeah. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jodha, sir. So the patient who is having menopause at 50 and come with any sort of spotting or bleeding, we have to look for the what can be the possible causes. So the PS has excluded many things, whether it is estrogen deficiency, vaginitis or cervicitis. So the next step is to do the imaging and at least a transvaginal sonography will tell us what is the endometrial thickness there, what is the ecotexture in the endometrial cavity or any sort of, or in adenexa if we find any type of cyst formation. Sometimes these patients in postmenopausal age group has cyst formation that secretes the estrogen that can proliferate the endometrium and and can cause endometrial proliferation or thickening and sometimes these bleeding may be there. So these are the patients who require endometrial aspiration first and exclude the cause. And if possible, then it will be better to do stroscopic examination in this endocervical canal. Is, and then uterine cavity can be just, and that will help and guide us because these are the patients where the risk of Malignancies is to be considered if a postmenopausal patient gets bleeding. We have to exclude these things. Right. So as you have said rightly, we have done the TBS. It has showed the normal uterus. And 
pneumonia was 5 mm, both ore is normal, no cyst, no fluid, no tenderness. Even as you said, endometrial biopsy was also done with hysteroscopy guide and it showed there was normal, no focal lesion and it was an atrophic endometrial. Now how should we should proceed? In so, fact, now there are some publications, very um, strong uh, evidence that if your endometrial thickness is five less than 5 millimeters in a postmenopausal bleeding, you can you may not do an endometrial biopsy. And you can straight away consider it as an atrophic um, um, endometrial. Right? Endometrial. Yeah. And then treat her with low dose estrogen or you know whatever you want yeah. to do. So, so now we have come to the conclusion that this is a case of atrophic, atrophic endometrial. Yeah. And uh, now true. how we should proceed? May I request Dr. Monika Gupta, madam? So just we have to give us some reassurance because the patient is in very much a panic state because she has got bleeding after eight years and simple tranexamic acid to stop the bleeding. Estrogen creams can be started if there is another problems like atrophic vaginitis and all. And we have to really follow up the patient because at that time the endometrial thickness is not there. And many times the many of the food materials are also having estrogens. So even after eating those, the patient can have bleeding. I have seen so many patients who are having postmenopausal bleeding and nothing comes out after the investigations. So Absolutely, we have to madam. ask her to come after six weeks. For right. Absolutely. So as was uh, Dr. Jodhasar was saying, this is a chart. Okay, this is how he has even said ki when uh, initially the office endometrial biopsy, as Madam has rightly said, ki when it is less than 4, 4 mm or 5 mm, there is no need of hysteroscopy. And if breeding resolves, there is no problem. But if it does not, then yes, we have to give her reassurance and some <clears throat> the estrogen therapy. And as in previous lecture, uh, Dr. Madam has, she has very clearly given the message that full-blown 0.625 E is not required. And CEA is not required. And even the half dose will work and uh, will not cause any cancerous lesions, but still it will uh, take care of the bone there. So here also, even with that half dosages, the many a times this atrophic endometrium gets cured. So what is your experience about the uh, estrogen and which estrogen should be used? What should be the use? What should be the dose? And what should be the root? Which estrogen? Dose yeah, and Dr. Sir? Uh, okay, it's not Dr. Suni. Dr. Aditi, you want to say, uh, comment on which estrogen will you use? Uh, Ma'am, I use conjugated estrogen because is, that is not very potent. And normally, initially, in such a woman, I would like to give local application in the form of cream. And I would like her to ask her to take it continuously for 10 days. And then maybe twice a week for three months. And as ma'am has rightly said, he call her for follow up. One thing I would like to add is that we should see for her any local, though it was mentioned, hysteroscopy, no focal lesion seen. But even a vaginoscopically, because post coital bleeding, uh, uh, some local, because the vagina is very thinned out. So sometimes the cause of bleeding might be urinary or some local lesion also. And unnecessarily the patient is panicking that it is in post endometrial bleeding or so that is very important in, the, in this set of women that you have to have a proper examine examination locally is there urethral carincle is there bleeding from some local spot has she hurt herself during coitus and sometimes the patient doesn't give the proper history also because of embarrassment or something because this age group they would not like to discuss it so this this is very important because otherwise everything is normal in this female as as the case has been discussed other than atrophic endometritis. Very, very good take-home message. I think a good perspectum examination and sometimes there can be local bleeding because of atrophic vaginitis also. They can have the bleeding. Here I would like to just mention a case, madam. There was a few years back in the institute, somebody put the uh, uh, what we do the for um, Collapse, they have put the uh, ring. 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 Yes. Ring. was put. But that Ring. woman was almost 56 to 57 years and later on she had a big trouble of the erosions of the uh, 
the vaginal cavity and because of this and uh, that was a case of atrophic endometrium with prolapse and then really that pessary caused a lot of trouble to that. so i think madam has said very good take home message thorough or speculum examination the of the vulva and then yes we should go ahead with that um so we have talked about type of estrogen those root um any any role of uh, add back therapy here no sir not in post menopausal okay. age group there is yes that will so, be uh, you know if we are treating a fibroid maybe with some kind of a luprite GnRH agonist, then we can talk about the add back. So that's a very good message. Okay, because many times uh, can I add something? Yeah. Yes, madam. Uh, basically, add back therapy, sir, is for those cases where there is a profound uh, suppression of the estrogen mm -hmm. levels, hypoestrogenic state, almost always, almost always due to a long uh, depot preparation of agonist which will suppress the HPO axis and that is where you require add back of estrogen, progesterone, tibolone, etc. But for natural menopause of eight years duration in a woman with uh, this sort of uh, atrophic endometrium, I don't think an add back therapy would help. It is a normal it's nutritional better, advice. It's better, you it's know, better if she is given calcium, you know. Yeah, but and uh, uh, hematinix, calcium, B complex, vitamin, vitamin D, D. That way, and life, and you know, a, a little bit of exercise, whatever she can do, weight management, uh, orthopedic support, that would be more uh, important to her. So, good take home message. Uh, very yeah, low dose well. estrogen can be given to the patient, like conjugated uh, estrogens, Dr. Monica mentioned, or even, you know, estradiol valerate. Just one milligram a day or point half a tablet of 0.625 premarin can no, or no. estrogen creams can be given, especially for urinary complaints. They many a times also have urinary complaints along with uh, uh, the spotting or postmenopausal spotting. So no, that you don't need to add progesterone in these cases. When you are giving very low doses of estrogen, just a nice follow-up. We should not think that this patient will have endometrial hyperplasia and she will have no malignancy. So you can just give very low doses of estrogen, just monitor her and slowly then you taper it down and then stop it. So that should be the way to go. Sunita, uh -huh. what, what diet will you advise? Uh, specifically because the madam was mentioning regarding the estrogen rich diet because there are some things which are available there. So what diet will we advise in these patients? Estrogen rich diet, what we usually? The soya bean is uh, co considered as estrogen rich, yes. sir. Isoflavon is. Right. Right. Isoflavon in Isoflavon. the soya bean. Right. So here I would like and to add. We have to take care of the calcium and vitamin D, uh, vitamin D and the micro and macronutrients in the diet also. Correct. And with the fiber like to... of water. Sir, so we should also Just do to... BTCT, PTINR for this patient because the, uh, in a dengue period or some other period, there can be some coagulation disorders which can be responsible for this spotting. Because I have one patient who is quite old and she has had dengue and she was admitted with my husband. I mean, like, he's an intensivist and we, she started having vaginal bleeding and everybody was not worried about her platelet count, but her family was worried about her vaginal bleeding Absolutely. and what we do, did is did a CBC for her and her platelet count was around 15,000 and that was the reason and it was difficult to convince them that that is the reason they were all worried about that CA to ne ho gaya at, at the age of 62 if somebody is having bleeding pain. Yeah. Correct. Absolutely. Last uh, question that uh, what should be our coital advice in such couples about the coitus, whether we should uh, tell them to avoid or uh, whether we should tell them to have the good uh, can, coitus. Can I answer, sir? Yes, please. Sir. I, uh, I was a part of sexual medicine committee for a long time with <laughs> Dr. Neeraj. So I took part uh, as faculty in many of these webinars, wherein there is yes. no need for her to uh, shun coitus uh, at this age or because of the spotting she has to be reassured again 
if because very many times the partner comes with the, the spouse comes with the patient to your consulting so he also has to be reassured that this is something which has to be just taken uh, with the uh, you know uh, calmness and complacency and uh, they can use liberal uh, liberally the lubricants and the jellies sometimes these women are not aware that such products are easily available i was just looking through on amazon for my patients and i saw a plethora of products with all side effects with customer ratings very much within reach now one patient wanted a particular brand which was available only from us and this brand is being shipped by amazon from us in 10 days so she got that also so it's like the patient just has to be told about this lubricants and jellies because all said and done the vagina is very thin there will be reduced sex drive there will be the spotting might cause her to be you know depressed so they have to be reassured and uh, encouraged to have a normal relationship physically absolutely in fact it has shown that ki the uh, sexual uh, when intercourse it improves the pelvic blood flows and yes. that's why we have to even tell them in fact in uh, dr prabhu has to say he used to say that ki it is the servicing of the vagina and mm-hmm. that's why in perimenopausal age in fact we to encourage them but as you have rightly said to with the lubricants with the proper precautions we should <laughs> tell them that yes they should go ahead with the coitus anybody would like to add or we should go to the last case yes right yeah minute please so okay. she is a 39 year old lady para 2 living to uh, one abortion previous to lcs she comes with menorrhage and dysmenorrhea lmp is 34 days before she has had a history of a previous surgery for incisional hernia she is pale on pv her uterus is 14 to 16 week size what next uh, dr monica gupta or dr aditi rathor you tell what what next ma'am i would uh, take her history proper history and then we i'll do her uh, urine pregnancy test to rule out pregnancy as her lmp was 34 days back and as the slide is itself showing that the differential diagnosis is you have to take a history of mother i'll do a proper per speculum and per pelvic examination which has been mentioned is 14 to 16 weeks then go for a sonography and in the ultrasound uh, we rule out it because size is 16 weeks so it can be either adenomyosis or a leiomyoma so uh, or uh, there might be some menorrhagic bleeding and then come to the diagnosis most probably as a case is suggesting it could be Uh, her upt was negative as it's saying in the ultrasound revealed fibroid uterus and hemoglobin was 8.6 gram so uh, she first of all she has to be uh, hemodynamically stable and her uh, cb uh, her blood, uh, blood counts have to be corrected her hemoglobin has to be improved so either iron sucrose or fcm has to be given and then uh, the fibroid uh, the decision has to be taken for the fibroid the uh, basically Do you want to add something to it? Yes. And we have to see what is the size of the fibroid and where is the positioning of the fibroid, because these all things are very important. If the fibroid is sub zero, say up sub zero, so we are not supposed to do anything. If it is encroaching into the myomet endometrium or into the myometrium, half of it in the myometrium or half of it in the endometrium, then we have to. go for something like that and when the size is around 14 to 16 weeks it means it's a very big fibroid so the medical management is not going to help much into it and i think the surgical treatment should be the better option for this patient so can i add go for the myomectomy or can i add something just yes, dr monica please yeah this patient walks into my opd I see that she is pale. I see the history thirty four days back. Straight away take a urine sample, take a blood for CBC if you have pathology there, and take her for a good trans vaginal trans abdominal sonography. Things will be sorted out. You rule out pregnancy on the table where you are doing the pregnancy test. You will get hemoglobin in one hour or two hours. And third thing, as soon as you enter the uterus, do a trans vaginal if she is empty bladder. you will see whether it's a fibroid adenomyoma whatever 
So it is a one stop, like a one stop fertility clinic. This is a one stop diagnosis. So within the next three, four hours, madam, we should be able to give a diagnosis and plan, propose plan of management to this patient. Totally agree with you. This is how we also function at our center. You know, we have a lab, we have an... But ma'am, ma nowadays there is no surety the patient is going to come and come back the next day. And and joke that man, you don't know. Practically, we have to do that. Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. From one end to coming to now the metro, they can come uh, faster. It takes one hour for them to come for the next visit. And they so, are so restless. Nowadays, patients are so restless for diagnosis and management. They've lost that patience, you know. They've yeah. lost that, you know, faith in the doctor that they want everything fast, fast, fast. So, and then one hour of counseling. After everything is done, yeah. the 45 After minutes. After that, they'll Google, Google everything and ask you yeah. cross questions also. Right. So just for discussion, not in this case, but what are the indications of the medical management in fibroids? Which drugs... It's are really efficacious and uh, especially in perimenopausal patients. Anybody can take this question. So the size of the fibroid should be less than four centimeter, and uh, the fibroid should, uh, for medical management, it should not be indenting. Mainly, the size should be less than four centimeters. The patient should have completed a family. She should, or mother, the patient. Uh, if the size is small and the patient is not desirous, so if he has not completed a family, so maybe we should go for medical management and the drug of choice. Uh, nowadays, uh, mifepristone is recommended, 25 milligram per day. And if the fibroid is not indenting the cavity, we can go for LNG IUS also. So these are the main two drugs which can be given for medical management and then you can give GNRH agonist also. So I think the position of the fibroid yes. is also Medical yes. management is definitely not recommended for zero one. Yeah. And sometimes even for two, because you have to, these are intracavitary. So they will cause some problem or the other for the patient. Yeah. yeah that patient has to be counseled. It should not be indenting the cavity at all. Zero yeah. one two, if present, should be managed uh, by surgical way only. Category but four two six are basically for medical, two two medical two management. Six. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Basically, for okay. medical management, best would be three, four, and sometimes five also. So, zero, one, and two are not no. to be done. Yeah, one and zero and one is definitely zero, one, and maybe two. But this is what I think is a take home message that Figo zero, Figo one, and maybe Figo two should be surgically managed. Figo two, if it is a larger sized fibroid, but you want to still want to do it lepros uh, hysteroscopically, even one, uh, you can then give GNRH, shrink the size of the fibroid, and then go for a hysteroscopic myomectomy. For Figo zero, you can also use tissue retrieval systems uh, like uh, Bigati shaver and uh, remove those fibroids. But others, um, intramural fibroid, I think what take home message is that we can go for a medical management. Uh, it's a good option. Right. Or if you want to add something. Just, uh, yeah, yeah, I will just uh, read here Foxy GCPR guidelines for the fibroids. And they are the same. That the intramural or sub myomas grade 2 to 6. Initially for the management, tranexamic acid, COCs, NCs, LNG, IUS. And if treatment fails, myomectomy depending upon location. So even here again in these guidelines, the importance to the location is being given. In women more than 40 years of age, where fertility is not desired, for small fibroids, medical management, where less size is less than 4 to 5 cm, followed by hysterectomy, short-term management up to 6 months with GNRH agonist, with that back followed by myomectomy, long-term management is LNG, IUS, and newer medical options like uh, the uripistol acetate or low dose maybe piston, uh, they are given. But here I would like to raise a question to you all that uh, is really uripristol effective? One thing I would like to add here, Gorak, one thing I would like to add, it is for the doctors yeah. who are attending. Whenever yeah. you want to use uh, agonist, and if it does not work, you would go for a surgery. So if you're going in for a laparoscopic surgery, suppose a five centimeters intramural fibroid, 
then it is better not to use an agonist because even if it becomes a size becomes smaller you don't get good planes on laparoscopy okay. so agonist yeah. is very good for submucous fibroid where it is la slightly larger then you would like to tackle with hysteroscope. There to reduce the size using lupride is a good option. But something which you can do laparoscopically and you want to reduce the size, there lupride is not so good because you will not get the planes at all. It gets very fibrous and it gets very difficult to remove laparoscopically. So this that is a very good take home message that one should understand where we want to preserve the fertility. We want to offer laparoscopic myomectomy. Ideally, the agonist should not be used because, again, it will disturb, start the planes. And uh, yes, that's a very great option. Now, my question is, will you bristol or mifepristol? Why? When? Uh, Sunita, madam. What is better in your practice? What, what is your observation, experience? Uh, mesoprostol, I think, is better. Mifepristol, Mifepristol, would be better. Yeah. It will be better. Any, yes. any other? Anybody can comment on this? Aditi, madam? Mifepristol is a cheaper, better level profile. Cheaper and then you don't have to go for regular level profile also. Because Unipristol is slightly hepatotoxic. But you have to go uh, very stringently for a regular level checker. And Mifepristol is cheaper, easily available. And I would not say it reduces the size of fibroid in my practice. Basically, it helps abating in the symptoms. So, in a smaller fibroid, in a pair, but the where you you can give a trial with mifepristone when the cavity is not indented, the patient is only having menorrhagia, and she uh, really. But the, I have found it very uh, useful in my practice, and right. basically, I found it useful in patients who are near uh, perimenopausal, basically. In six months, seven months, eight months or a year, they attain their menopause and the fibroids then gradually shrinks. Sir, RAR, sir, Dr. B.L. RAR, sir, yeah. you, have, sir you have said that, yes, ki, uh, in uh, government practice, these drugs are not available and absolutely right. But, sir, in such cases, where uh, what, what, what will be the option? What is the better thing for the medical management of fibroids? What do you do in the government practice? Jodha, sir? Sir has left, I think. He yes. had left a message. Yes, yes sir. Sir, we can just give some hormones to them. Simple progesterone or COCs can be given because whatever we are having in the government setup, we have to use them only or in the... In, or we can just tell them. We don't give in their writing. Okay, there are some other drugs also. If you want to have, you have got an options also. You can go to, well, we can refer to our private practitioners or, or other doctors. And we can at least counsel them. Okay, the other options are available. But because we are not having these drugs over there, so we are only supposed to give these only drugs to you. But is this because, a law that Dr. Monica Gupta? Yeah, ma'am, this is a law. Well, if you write something which is not available in the government, you have to, they can, they give, they make a real fuss out of it and they make the doctor, they make a complaint against the doctor. They are writing the drug outside for some other benefits. They don't think it is a beneficial for the patient. They think it is a beneficial for the doctor to write a drug which is not available in the government setup. Right. So, so I think again, that is an organizational point. We have got that the essential drugs, many essential drugs, which should be available in the government sector because they are not there, we are not able to give the justice to our patients. So I think uh, we should but take... I think it also differs from state to state because okay. uh, what Rajasthan uh, esteemed uh, doctors are telling us, yeah. it is like, uh, uh, I think, peculiar to Rajasthan. Mm -hmm. In uh, Madhya Pradesh, the government is very uh, government doctor friendly. In fact, too friendly to them. So left and right, they are writing uh, medicines in the private sector, even for uh, C-sections. If medicines are not available, patient is getting from outside. Mirena, they are getting from outside and getting inserted. So over mm -hmm. here, there are no legal hassles like in Rajasthan. What I've noticed in my state, because we are very friendly with the government sector, because we are in Bhopal Obsgaini Society, there is a close network of uh, government doctors. 
and uh, private sector. Right. Right. Because so, why I raise this question? Because again, we are discussing on the platform of the Foxy and especially of the public awareness committee. So I think uh, we all should uh, help us uh, together and interstate uh, what is going on, we should know. So great. I think rest of the states like Rajasthan, Maharashtra, <coughs> I think we have to work on the line what MP is doing. Yeah, I right. think Maharashtra is also liberal, Minu ma'am. Maharashtra is also quite liberal. It is liberal. Uh, but it is not liberal. in, not, in not Rajasthan in all was cases. the first state to impose the RTI, right to health. Means yes. every doctor mm -hmm. has to do a free treatment if Mala, what yes. is the uh, definition yes. of emergency? Nobody knows. So if yes. a patient says Ki, I don't have a money, you have to treat the patient. And how it is possible? How you can uh, insert Mirana to every patient free of cost? Even you, you have to purchase the Mirana mm -hmm. by yourself. So there are many hassles and we have to make a path in between. Yeah, I will request the Foxy to yeah. provide all these drugs in government supply like Marina, like Unipristol, like Mapistone, so we can treat the patient better. We yeah. are short of all these drugs. You, Although we have asked the government to supply the Marina and all these drugs, but still they are not available because government says you have to take the minimum drugs, minimum drugs which is essential because there are uh, uh, many drugs which can treat this uh, AUB, many drugs which can treat the fibroid and the adenomyces. So these two, three drugs, there's progesterone, COCs, these can you can use. And if not, then you do the stectomy. So A very but, good suggestion, BL sir. A very good suggestion, and definitely we will try to take this message to the office of the Foxy so that uh, something can be done. That um, in some states where these th things are not available, so how the, there is the essentiality of these medicines that definitely as an organization we can tell to the government health sector. And because uh, we, because the, we are for the betterment of the uh, patient, and what is the mm -hmm. role? Because we are le uh, learning new things. The things, uh, the uh, drugs come in the government facility after 10 to 15 years. Still, yes. we are on the stage one, project on one and two, only those. Yes. Last, and only last year, only the last year, because of uh, our recommendation, the diprogestron is supplied now, two years oh. back. Diprogestron yes. and natural progesterone. In last yeah, two I years. Think that slowly things will change. And we are, we are prescribing these in gunny bags to the patients, actually. Anna. <laughs> but sir, we have rightly said we should, as an organization, definitely sure, sure. we should go to the government and we should go ahead. So last slide and last question of this uh, today's panel is, uh, yes, now everything was not uh, helpful and now we have taken the decision of his sector. So when to take such decision and which route and why? Whether it should be abdominal, vaginal, LAVH or total laparoscopic hysterectomy, uh, what guideline says and what is the practical? Everybody should, uh, I think, answer one by one. Sir, I think whatever the route the surgeon is comfortable with. Yes. Is a the skill of the, the patient and the uh, surgeon is responsible for that. The what, skill, uh, absolutely. And availability of <laughs> laparoscope is again a thing. Mala, if the <laughs> doctor is very uh, competent, he can do a uh, lap hysterectomy in any of the case with the previous two cesarean, a big uterus and fibroids or adenomyces, endometriosis. But everybody is not that expert. So yeah. whatever your efficiency is there, it, your expertise, you have to choose the method of it. Right. So, so the patient has come to you. With our expertise, we have to see what the patient also needs. And if we are not expert enough, we should refer the patient to the expert then. Okay. So that, that means also means so saying so that... Patient, what surgery patient goes through will depend on which OPD he walks into. One, two, three, four, <laughs> four surgeons are sitting. And even in Ruby Hall, we, we say the same thing. Like, it goes to Minu, Madam, OPD will go for a laparoscopy, go to this person's OPD, will go for a vaginal. So, it actually patients luck also sometimes. Yes, sometimes, yes absolutely. Yeah, that was I was going to say. Sunita, Madam, you remember that even in some units, we, we have been trained to... Mm -hmm. To the vaginal hysterectomy till 16 to 18 weeks. Yes. 
said the non descent vaginal hysterectomy with the coring and slowly taking out the uh, fibroid definitely it is helpful only thing is the first answer by monika gupta madam was very right that whatever the surgeon is comfortable but again i will add aditi madam's sentence that the patient should be fully convinced with this uh, method and then with thorough discussion with thorough consent we have to tell them these are the alternatives these are the benefits these are the problems these are the expertise these are the cost involved these are the days of uh, admission involved and depending upon that we have to take i would decision. also like to add one more thing here since it is a fibroid uterus she is around 50 or whatever 50 plus years of age yes. we have to keep in mind the possibility of a sarcomatous change in the fibroid oh. ldh levels mri if required and no morselation if you have a little little doubt also that it could be sarcomatous so those are the patients where we should go for a open surgery or even vaginal is fine but no or morselation in the back so these things should be kept in mind and should be told to the patient when we are dealing with these patients Because Absolutely. Is... Though there was a good paper by Singh et al. and the Singh said that that key the incidence of uh, sarcomatous change in fibroid is point zero point zero one percent. Used to be still, not anymore. Ah. Huh. Yes. But still, as what Madam has said is rightly right, very right. That key the days have gone. I mean, just to take one paper and comment on it, we have to keep in the mind and with slightest doubt, at least what Madam has said, those precautions we must. Uh, take in our practice so the take home messages by everybody one by one regarding the management of aub in perimenopausal age group we'll start with dr sunita then dr monika first, singh and monika gupta madam first thing i would say is proper history taking is a must and proper examination of a uh, patient including the ps and pv examination of the patient that should be a compulsory thing whenever you are dealing with anything even if the patient is bleeding you should do a ps for her absolutely dr gupta so i want to just comment ki we have, when whenever we are taking the history the patient is already taking treatment from one or the two other doctors we should know ki what treatment is she is taking and whether she is taking it regularly or not many times i have come across the patient who are taking oc's very irregularly whenever they feel like they take it and whenever they st- uh, don't feel like they stop it and that is the major reason for the menorrhagia in most of the patient so we have to keep a very good eye on it ki what type of medicine she has taken and for how long and whether it was a very regular one or not yes dr dl rar sir sir after uh, taking proper history examination we have to counsel the patient the counseling of the patient is the best whether we treat her medically or surgically because counseling what she wants so it is better to counsel the patient or because now i am retired from government servants government service so i i counsel every patient of perimenopausal bleeding and most of them they have accepted that please give me medical treatment and i assure still medical treatment is the best and as you say vaginal hysterectomy abdominal hysterectomy laparoscopic hysterectomy still we senior doctors are best to like the abdominal hysterectomy because these everything is uh, behind, uh, uh, in front of our eyes and because of the good antibiotic era there is no any difference in infection rate okay dr monika singh madam i feel uh, that uh, palm coin classification everybody should have in their minds 
not uh, to be means it should be just imprinted in your head number one number two figo classification of fibroid should be in your subconscious <laughs> classify immediately number three every gynecologist should be perfect in her tbs examination great um, so the person for imaging science committee this was my advocacy that every gynecologist should be able to do a basic gynecological ultrasound and should be able to at least read and do a basic anti-scan. Madam, so, I think you have, you only have taught me because, <laughs> right, right. because so, I attended your Foxy FMFI course. Oh, so yes, we did those so I, was, I was a very sincere student of FMF UK, FMF India, uh -huh. then Dr. Suresh, uh, everywhere I was there. Okay. Uh -huh. Dr. Aditi, and then we'll uh, continue the session. I think everything has been very, all the take-homes have been given. I think we have to be thorough in our examination of the patient. We should not jump to conclusions. The perimenopausal is the age group where the, the, the borderline is thin between sarcomatous stem of the malignancy and benign lesions. So we should always keep in mind that our investigation should be thorough and proper use of sonography and everything should be done. And the patient and medical management should be the mainstay. We should not jump to unnecessarily unnecessary hysterectomies and i would just like to say because this is a public awareness uh, meeting also uh, one of my colleagues is facing uh, inquiry by the collector recently only i cannot name her but uh, she did a hysterectomy uh, in a uh, hospital owned by a quack basically a bhms so he admitted the patient and he asked her for a hysterectomy and she the consent was taken and the hysterectomy was done and now the patient uh, put an allegation that uh, um, she was having some urinary problems because the thorough history has to be important. So she was having some urinary complaints, hysterectomy was, and mild adenomyosis was shown in the scan, which was done somewhere, and hysterectomy was done. The patient is 42 years of age. She has a 12-year-old child. So now the collector, the single line the collector has asked, he, whether the treatment given was in lines of the diagnosis made. So the diagnosis was cystitis and mild adenomyosis. The treatment done was hysterectomy. So therefore, we should always, always go for medical management first. Write it on a piece of paper. The patient is advised for medical management. If, and then only the surgical management should be option offered. So thank you very much, all panelists. I think it was a very great discussion. Because many a times what happens is we take too many cases. And we discuss uh, many what not things, but I think each point, each case was discussed very well. So we are very much thankful. I am very much thankful to Dr. Meenu Madam as well because she has given many insights. Uh, I thank Dr. Monika Umbardhan Madam for inviting us, though it was a last minute invitation, but uh, really we enjoyed this. And I thank Dr. Dankur Roy and uh, all Foxy members, all my panelists, chairpersons. And thank you very much. And we must say thank you to Corona because, uh, again, yes, such webinars are needed. Not always the product oriented webinars should be done. But uh, these are very fruitful discussions and the fantastic. Uh, I am very much thankful and I am happy. Uh, over to you, Dr. Meenu, Madam. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Corona. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma thank you, ma thank thank you Gorak, sir thank oh, you Shikha, Shikha. 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 thank you all thank the panelists you. it was a very nice blend of people who are in private practice as well as people people who are in government sector so we could get the insight from both the angles and we could understand you know how to manage this patient so very very good take home messages i think from uh, all the panelists were fantabulous you i mean everybody gave a very very good take home points and I'm sure the people who have attended this particular webinar have enjoyed it. And uh, thank you, Corona team. Thank you, Priyankur. I don't see him. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Satabdi, for nice introductions. And uh, thank you, everyone here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, before Satabdi gives the official vote of thanks, I would like to also thank the Gorak sir for chipping in at the last moment. Actually, this panel was supposed to be taken by Madhuri ma'am but because she was traveling to a meeting in Hyderabad she couldn't join in. Gorak sir thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being there at the last minute as a savior. You know ma'am you have done a complete justice to uh, the topic in spite of not being a forte for you. 
ma'am definitely when we have any fetal medicine uh, program or any imaging uh, endoscopy program i will always invite you again ma'am thank you <laughs> Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Yes. Wishing everybody a very happy Diwali. Happy Diwali, happy Diwali to you as Thank well. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Same to you. Thank you. Happy See Diwali you again till the next webinar. Good night. Yes. Thank you all. Bye, Bye. webinar. We should meet up. <laughs> sure, ma'am. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abhishek, for being Thank the you, technical support. Thank you, Corona. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Monica, ma'am. Thank you.